2020. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting session that we're going to go through here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in this session is Cisco Silicon, and we're going to talk specifically about ASICs that Cisco develops. What I hope to communicate in this session is the uh, importance of ASICs, how, how we develop them, how we uh, create them, why we create them the way we do, and the functionality that they provide. So I think this will hopefully be a really, really interesting session for you. Now, anybody who's ever seen me present before will know that somewhere in my presentations there's going to be a picture of a rocket or a high-performance aircraft. This particular rocket is a space launch system that NASA is developing. And the reason for that is because I tend to talk through things at a fairly fast rate, and that's why I put the hashtag high bit rate uh, on the bottom of my presentation. So by way of introduction, my name is Dave Zaks. I'm a director of innovation for the CX team within Cisco. I've been with Cisco about 20 years. Inside Cisco, we say we live in dog years. So if you're a little dog, that's five years per year. If you're a big dog, that's seven years per year. So on that basis, I've been with Cisco anywhere from 100 to 140 years uh, so far. You can see on the bottom of the slide here some of the things that I tend to focus on, uh, which are flexible hardware, fabric networks, assurance, and machine learning. Those are all the kind of the areas that I specialize in within the company. And today, specifically, we're going to talk a lot about flexible hardware and delve into that in some depth. Now, this is a quote that Chuck Robbins tweeted out. He tweets out from time to time, and I captured this one when Chuck treated, tweeted it because I happen to really agree with this, net, this sentiment the network's going to be more important than it's ever been because the network is really at the center of everything that we do in IT. Uh, everything connects to it, servers, uh, data centers, users, everything attaches through network, but I'm actually going to take the liberty of correcting Chuck because in my opinion, it's not so much about the network being more important than it's ever been. It's about innovation in the network being more important than it's ever been. And that's really kind of what I want to go through in the session, is talk about all the innovation that we're doing in silicon and that we're doing in ASICs. So most people have probably seen a stack like this, uh, talking about how we develop intent-based networking. And typically, a lot of times, we focus at the top of the stack, up here with the applications and APIs and domain controller, things like Cisco DNA Center. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do in this talk is focus at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the ASIC, the silicon layer at the bottom that forms the basis of all the platforms and products. So why do we want to start there with ASICs? Well, ASICs really are the foundational component that everything else is based on top of, and the functionality provided by those ASICs really conditions what we can do with the platforms they're made out of and what we can do with the solutions that we make out of all the different platforms that we have. So here's a picture of David Geckler. You probably saw him at the keynote yesterday for Cisco Live. I took this picture a few years ago, and David is holding something in his hand there and pointing at it. And the thing that he's holding is one of these. It's a UADP chip. Effectively, this is a chip that forms the basis of the Catalyst 9000 product family, and before that, the Catalyst 3850 and 3650 platforms. So uh, that we're going to... Uh, one of the things we, we're going to talk about those chips, and one of the things we often see our executives saying is that ASICs really are a pillar of Cisco innovation. I think that's absolutely true, but I want to explore in this session why that is and how important they are. Because ASICs are a bit of a hidden gem in our portfolio. I don't think we talk about them enough. Now, interestingly, I have given out a few of these ASICs to people over time, and sometimes they're not so much a hidden gem. This is uh, an ASIC that I uh, gave this ASIC to a friend of ours, and she turned it into jewelry. She actually turned it into a, a necklace. And so that'd be one of my challenges is if I end up giving you an ASIC at some point, uh, see what you can do creatively with it to uh, actually uh, turn it into something that might be a piece of art. Um, so to really talk about ASICs, we have to have a common language about ASICs and how they're designed and how they're built. So I'm gonna go through a, a short uh, period here where we're gonna talk about ASICs and how they are designed and built, from, kind of from definition to deployment. So when we start thinking about how we develop an ASIC, there's many, many things that go into it. We have to think about the state of the art of what's possible, uh, market transitions that are happening, technology trends, R&D, what are customers asking for, how much investment protection and backwards compatibility do we need to provide, what are our competitors doing? All those things get synthesized through marketing, and then marketing interfaces with engineering, and you can see that's a very much a two-way arrow, because marketing will ask for the moon, the sun, and the stars, and engineering will say, well, I can't give you the moon, I can give you the moon and the sun, but the stars are gonna cost more money. There's a back and forth process, but at the end of it, what you end up producing is a specification for the chip and what it needs to do. After that, the code, the chip, actually starts off as code. Most people don't know that something that starts off as hardware, like this, 
is actually starts, off, starts its life as software. The chip gets written as code. There are two languages that are used in the industry commonly for this. One is Verilog and one is VHDL. Cisco uses Verilog. And essentially this, car, this, this chip right here, which contains about three billion transistors on it, uh, actually represents a couple of million lines of Verilog code. So the chip would get coded over a period of months, and then we'd run it through a process called synthesis. That code would essentially get compiled, but it wouldn't compile to an object code that would run on your laptop or your smartphone. It actually compiles to what we call a net list, and a net list is a file, maybe a gigabyte in size. That's what we would actually send out to the chip manufacturer to get the chip physically built. Now the chip itself is actually designed in pieces, and it has to go through a thing called floor planning and placement. You essentially design the chip in functional blocks, different areas on the chip, just kind of like designing rooms in a house. You'd have different rooms, different areas. This is a bit of an art as well as a science because you, uh, for the different functional blocks that are placed on a chip, we have electromagnetic interference effects between the different areas of the chip that have to be accounted for, but effectively we're connecting it up to power, we're limiting crosstalk, we're doing all the things that are necessary to get us to a functional chip design. After that comes the process that most people are probably most familiar with, which is actually etching the design onto a silicon wafer. So we start off with one of these. This is a raw ingot of silicon. This is what would go in one end of the factory. Effectively, you would have here a, 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 a chunk of the pure silicon material. You're going to then refine that down into an ultra-pure wafer, and onto that you're going to photo image the chips themselves. So we have a light source that would uh, effectively etch the chips onto this. Now, because of the uh, high density that we use for chips today, we don't actually etch that on using light anymore because the uh, wavelength of light is too coarse. We actually use ultraviolet, or today even extreme ultraviolet radiation, to actually etch the image onto that chip. And the chip is etched on with multiple layers as well, just like multiple layers in a circuit board. It's a very involved process. This is typically where you see the people in a clean room uh, running around. Now what we're really talking about here is transistors and how many transistors can I fit onto a silicon chip. Those transistors used to be discrete transistors, now the transistors are actually implemented with a technology called MOSFET, Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. That is a phrase that you should take back and talk to your family about tonight uh, and quiz them on because that's just such a cool acronym. But effectively what this is is shrinking the transistor down to a very, very small size onto the die. And in fact, these are so small today that we actually use a technology called FinFET, where the transistor is spun on its side and we effectively build the transistors up in 3D to get greater packing density, kind of like moving from a single dwelling house into a high rise. Now, it's a little known fact, but the entire technology industry, not just networking, but everything in technology, is fundamentally based on two gate constructs, two circuit constructs called a NAND gate, a not AND gate, and a NOR gate, a not OR gate. These two gates have the interesting Boolean property that they can be combined into virtually any logic circuit. So effectively what we're doing is taking that code that was written, running it through a synthesis process and, and, and ultimately laying out a, a, a huge number of gates, millions and millions and millions of gates onto the silicon die, which ultimately is what we're going to produce the chips out of. When you see this silicon die, what you're looking at is many, many, many chips that are etched onto that and then the chips are all cut into pieces, packaged, and put into uh, this traditional silicon chip that, that you would see. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a bit of a space buff. So here's a bit of a fun fact. We put a man here, as long as you believe that we actually did put a man on the moon, and if you don't, we can have an interesting discussion later about that. Uh, but we put a man here on the moon using this thing called the Apollo Guidance Computer, and that computer was built from 4,100 individual integrated circuits each one of contain, which contained a single three input not or gate. So in other words, we put a man on the moon with less than 10,000 transistors, but today we take more than 19.2 billion transistors on the most advanced one of these chips uh, to uh, route your packets with the appropriate QoS and encryption and fragmentation and everything else that we do on that chip. So what we're really talking about here is transistors and how many transistors we can pack onto a silicon die. Now most people are probably pretty familiar with Moore's Law. Moore's Law basically states that uh, every 18 to 24 months, the number, uh, number of transistors we can pack onto a chip will double. But of course, that's not a progression of 2, 4, 6, 8. That's a progression of 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and a runaway, uh, uh, runaway progression. 
So uh, it's really uh, the ever-shrinking transistor. We've gone from 65 nanometer to 45 nanometer to 32 or 28 nanometer or 22 nanometer. The current state of the art is seven nanometer chip manufacturing and probably will be at five nanometer chip manufacturing within about probably the next 12 to 18 months in production. So a lot of people have a challenge with understanding how small a nanometer or a billionth of a meter is. So maybe by uh, some comparisons will help. A human hair is actually 100,000 nanometers in width. So if you take a look at an individual hair on your arm or on your head, what you're gonna see is something that's 100,000 nanometers wide. Maybe that gives you some idea of how small a nanometer is, but maybe we can draw another comparison too. If we took one of those hairs, cut it into cross section like this, so that's a cross section of a single human hair, and made that as tall as the Empire State Building in New York, uh, on that scale, a red blood cell would stretch up to about the 10th floor on that sale, a single red blood cell. A bacterium over here would stretch up to about the third floor. A piece of protein on that scale would be about the size of a small dog down here on the sidewalk. And then finally over here, we come to this little pinprick, which would be a size of three pennies stacked on top of each other. And next to that Empire State Building sized hair, those three pennies stacked together represent one nanometer. Now we build chips with transistors that are nanometer sized, like I mentioned, seven nanometer or 14 nanometer chips are very common today. And if you don't think this is magic that we can build things at this scale, then I don't know how to explain magic to you. Um, this is incredible technology that we use. So there's a whole process, as I mentioned, that we go through to design and develop chips. Typical timeline for a chip from an idea on a whiteboard to something that we're actually shipping out to the market is anywhere from two to five years. And the chip that I'm gonna talk about here a lot actually took us five years to design. So there's a lot that goes into building ASICs. There's a lot of time and treasure that's spent developing chips. And the first question you might ask is, why do we do it? Why do we go out and develop our own chips? Why doesn't Cisco just go out to the market and buy chips from merchant silicon vendors and base our products on that? And the answer is sometimes we do that. But only a very small percentage of what Cisco actually ships to the market is based on what we call merchant silicon. The vast majority of our products are use Cisco custom designed silicon for a bunch of reasons. One of those reasons would be something like simpler deployment options. So one of the things that we really, really would like to have is the ability to simplify network deployments. Most people are probably familiar with the Catalyst 6500 platform. Uh, the Catalyst 6500 has a really interesting deployment option called VSS, Virtual Switch System. And what, we, what we're able to do with VSS is to uh, take two Catalyst 6500s, link them together with a number of 10 gigabit interfaces and make them into a single switch, I'll have them operate as a single switch. Now in order to do that, you have to actually extend the backplane header the a packet would have when it goes into a switch. In other words, when a packet goes into a switch, there's a bunch of information about the packet that doesn't come in with the packet. These are things like, for example, uh, you know, which port did I come in on? Which port am I leaving on? What's my priority in crossing the switch fabric backplane? In order to link two switches together as one with a virtual switch system on a Catalyst 6500, we need to extend that backplane header between the switches. We have an ASIC, codenamed R2D4, that lives in the Catalyst 6500 supervisor module, which extends that backplane header for us. In other words, if I want the simpler deployment option, I need to have silicon support for it. Uh, another thing might be better insight and optimization. So for example, one of the things that we really place a lot of value on is understanding what's happening in our networks. And for that, we need to use a technology like NetFlow. Now, if you think about what a switch or a router normally does, if I'm a switch or a router, a packet comes into me, I send it on to, a, figure out where it needs to go, send it along to its destination without reference to any packet that came before or any packet that's gonna come after. In other words, switches and routers normally operate statelessly. But there are a lot of uh, instances where I might want to have uh, stateful information re retained from the device. For example, maybe I'm tracking all the flows in the network from a security perspective, or I want to tr do traffic planning, traffic analysis. So I want to use NetFlow. Now, if you want to have, build NetFlow into a device, you need to build that in in the silicon. You can't add this later through software. And especially if we want a security application, I might to main, need to maintain NetFlow information on every single packet going through the network. In other words, I can't just use sampled NetFlow and look at one out of every 100 or one out of every 1,000 packets. That might be good enough for statistical analysis, 
but it wouldn't do me any good for a security application because there I need to be tracking every single flow. If you want full flow net flow in your ASIC, you have to design that in up front. And that's one of the reasons why we would take a look at that as a marketing requirement and then take that all, through, all the way through into the silicon design. We might want to increase security. We might want to be able to use more flexible security and things like Cisco TrustSec, for example. If I want to be able to understand TrustSec headers in packets, I need to build that in in silicon. We, of course, need to build it to the appropriate scalability for devices. Things are, di are different at the access layer than they're diff different in the core in terms of scale and table size. But probably the most important aspect of this is what I call flexibility and investment protection through programmability. And let me talk a little bit about that. So uh, when we think about how, when we put network devices into our deployments, we normally want those devices to, ask, to last for a period of time. Usually when I talk to customers about this, they will tell me that they want that switch to last five years or seven years or maybe even 10 years in a deployment. But think how much has changed in technology industry over the last five to 10 years. We're now seeing all these things come in with fabrics and integrated security requirements into networks. We're seeing encryption come in. We're seeing all these different requirements uh, come into a network environment. And what we need is the flexibility to adapt to these because when these new technologies come along, we want to be able to adopt them. We don't want to have to rip and replace big chunks of our network in order to get there. So the here's how a traditional networking ASIC works. Ours or anybody else's traditional non-flexible ASIC. You'd have a packet come into a port on an ASIC. So here's a representation of a packet coming into a port. Normally what would happen is that packet would come into the port on the switch. And when it goes into the switching ASIC, the first thing it would go into is a parser block. The job of the parser block over here is to figure out what is this packet. Is it IPv4? Is it IPv6? Is it MPLS? What is it? It's going to examine it. Remember we said the chip started as code? There's going to be code here that's now been turned into hardware, to silicon, that's going to examine that packet to figure out what it is. And that will handle a certain number of packet headers that it's pre-coded or pre-wired -pre to do. Then the packet is going to move down a pipeline and in that pipeline, it's going to reference some very fast memory tables, but the pipeline itself is going to be fixed. It's going to have layer two lookups, layer three lookups, ACL lookups, QoS lookups, and you know, the, the functionality of that pipeline, again, was uh, created not at the time you buy the product, but the time we designed it, which could have been years earlier than when you buy it. Now, it's going to go through an ingress pipeline, the packet's then going to go down an egress pipeline, assuming we didn't decide to drop it by reason of an ACL or something, the packet's going to go down an egress pipeline, go through a similar set of lookups on the egress pipe. At the end of that, we're going to go through a rewriter block where we're going to rewrite the packet. So, for example, we might be rewriting the MAC address for next hop, decrementing TTL for next hop, and we're going to forward the packet out. Now, this is how any traditional networking ASIC works. They've worked this way for years. They're very fast, but the challenge is they're fixed function. If you want a set of capabilities that that chip doesn't do, then you're kind of out of luck. So for example, uh, right here, I have a chip. This is a chip called Aludra. This is the, uh, the heart of the Catalyst 6500, very, very popular switch platform, 6500 and 6800. This is a traditional fixed function ASIC. So this means that it can handle, for example, on that chip, IPv4, IPv6, MPLS, GRE, and hardware. That's all great, but for example, it doesn't do VXLAN in hardware. If you want VXLAN, that particular chip is not capable of doing it in hardware because that protocol didn't exist when the chip was designed. So what can we do about this? How can we, how can we address this challenge that this uh, ASICs are fixed in nature and yet we want to keep devices in our network for a long period of time because the really, real innovation is moving from hardware to software in networks. So the challenge here is that if I have a fixed pipeline, packet comes along like VXLAN or something like that that the packet chip doesn't know how to handle, you'll get this dreaded not supported in hardware. Now what that means is at that point there's really only two things. If a packet comes along the, chip, the fixed chip is not designed to understand, there's really only two things the chip can do. It can either punt the packet to CPU, in which case we'll go from millions of packets per second to maybe a few thousand packets per second, so not very useful or the chip can drop it. So those really are your only two options if you end up with protocols that aren't supported in traditional fixed chip hardware. But yet we see the network evolving. We see the evolution of the network to address things like fabrics, which are based on VXLAN and LISP and TrustSec and these different protocols, which we need to run end to end to create the intent-based networks that we want to have. So this is really where flexible ASICs come to, come to help us. The concept here is that a flexible ASIC is itself 
programmable. So different elements on the chip can be changed through software. What you would see as a new iOS version that you load onto a device and reboot the device, all of a sudden you get a whole new level of functionality, but you get it in hardware because what we've done is we've changed or updated the microcode on that chip in real time, and now you've got a whole new level of ASIC functionality, but you get it at hardware speeds. So this is really an incredible capability. So for example, if we take a look at how does a flexible chip differ from a fixed chip, the first thing you'd see over here is that we have a flexible parser. The, remember I talked about that parser block and the portion of the chip that figures out what the packet is when it comes in? Well, on a flexible chip, the parser block is itself programmable. So we can program that parser block to look at any different field in the header of the chip. For example, this chip, which is the heart of a Catalyst 9000 series switch, this particular chip, uh, it can look up to 256 bytes deep into the packet header. It can parse on and alter anything in those two first 256 bytes. That gives us the ability to handle almost any packet header out there that we know about. Uh, even maybe packet header formats that haven't been invented yet, we could reprogram the flexible parser to understand them. Then we take those fixed blocks, those formerly fixed blocks in the, in the ASIC pipeline, and turn those into flexible programmable blocks as well. So what we see is that every, every block here can take a look at and alter the packet individually. In this particular chip, the UADP chip, the Unified Access Data Plane chip that the, uh, the, the Catalyst 9000 is based on, we actually have a 17 stage ingress pipeline, an eight stage egress pipeline, so I have uh, 22 or 25 stages depending on the version of the chip that we can, and each stage that we can examine the packet with, and each stage can do zero, one, or two lookups on the packet. So we literally have dozens of opportunities to examine and modify the packet as it moves down this flexible pipeline. At the end of the flexible pipeline, we also have what we call a flexible rewriter. So again, the portion of the, the chip that rewrites the packet, that changes the packet as the packet's getting routed through the device is itself programmable. So we can rewrite the, the packet in multiple different ways depending on what we need. So really what this gives us at the end of the day is complete flexibility in the forwarding pipeline, very, very different than a traditional fixed ASIC and much more flexible and capable. So if, for example, I can build a chip and these chips will handle IPv4, IPv6, MPLS, GRE, uh, you know, all these different functions, including things, more advanced functions like VXLAN, for example. Now VXLAN is an interesting one because VXLAN and GRE as well are tunneling protocols and really all the interesting things that we see happening in networking today are based around tunnels. So I'm going to talk in a short bit about how the chip handles some of these protocols that are tunneled. But one of the key things here is the flexibility that this chip offers and a, a flexible chip like this offers. If we invented IPv7 tomorrow, and we hope the industry doesn't invent IPv7 because we've taken 20 years to adopt IPv6, but if the industry were to invent IPv7 tomorrow, we could probably handle it through this concept of the flexible programmable pipeline. Very, very powerful concept. Now I talked a little bit about tunneling and how uh, tunneling is required for certain protocols. So for example, let's say I took an IPv4 packet, spun it through the chip, and my forwarding decision was this needs to forward into a VXLAN tunnel. Maybe it's entering a, a fabric, like an SD access fabric, for example. So I'd take that IPv4 packet and I'd wrap it in a VXLAN header, but now the destination of the packet has changed because now it's going to the endpoint of the VXLAN tunnel and not the endpoint where the user originally sent it to. That means I need to take the packet for another spin through the chip. We highly optimize the chip for what we call recirculation in terms of bandwidth and performance. For example, in this UADP chip, I can recirculate a packet off the end of the egress pipeline back to the beginning of the ingress pipeline in less than 500 nanoseconds. So we have very, very high performance research path. In other words, I can recirculate the packet through this chip so quickly that you won't notice it. And we could actually recirculate the packet up 16 times if we needed to. Uh, we don't have a need in this chip to recirculate it more than seven times with any use case we've currently come up with. But the recirculation is really key because all the innovation that's happening now in networking typically involves some sort of tunnel and requires recirculation. So the point here is really, it's very, very exciting, and I hope I'm communicating the, the passion that I have for this to you about how with ASICs that are programmable, we have the capability to update via software the chip, but still operate the functions at hardware speed. I remember the first time I saw this within Cisco, sitting in the back of a building with a couple of hundred engineers 
in that building. And there was a lecturer at the front who was talking about this chip. This is probably about three years before we shipped the first version of the UADP chip in 2013. And this particular engineer uh, was a, a gentleman named Hiroshi Suzuki. He would develop a lot of QoS functions within the chip. And I would estimate on Hiroshi that this up here runs at about 200, 100 to 200 gigabits per second. This runs at about 25 gigabits per second, so there's a significant speed mismatch there. And as you can tell by his name, he's Japanese by, by origin. And so when he gets excited, it all kind of comes out with 16-bit encryption. So I remember sitting at the back of a room of a couple hundred engineers trying to keep up with 25 gigabits per second of 16-bit crypto. But when I understood what we had built in this flexible chip, my instinct as an engineer was to stand up and applaud. Because finally we built this piece of silicon that we could adapt to different functions over time. And it's just a, it's just a huge advance in what we're able to do. So you've seen this type of silicon come into our product line over time. You've seen this evolution from former platforms like a 3550 and 3750, if folks remember those platforms, that were based on fixed function ASICs, up to our latest generation of silicon, the UADP, which really came to market with the 3850 and 3650 platforms and is now the heart of everything that we build in the Catalyst 9000, right from the bottom of the, the range with the 9200 to the top of the range, and you can see that this is all Cisco developed silicon. So we've developed all of this in house and we reap all the benefits of what I would call vertical integration by doing so. And you can see that uh, you know, the, the, the very sophisticated chips, seven and a half billion transistors, or the latest one now is actually 19.2 billion transistors. These are among the densest pieces of silicon being developed anywhere in the world. So again, this is a family of chips. It's been an evolution from our initial platforms based on UADP 1.0 and 1.1 up to UADP 2.0 and 3.0, which really formed the basis now of the Catalyst 9K product line. And our latest version of this, because we don't always just make things bigger, we've actually gone smaller with a mini-me version of the UADP 2.0 mini, and this is actually what we base the Catalyst 9200 platforms on. So again, it's an evolution over time of all of these platforms. When we take a look at the core architecture of the chip, we see that we have on one side of it an ingress forwarding controller, talking to those high performance lookup tables, an egress looking forwarding controller. So this is kind of the block diagram of the chip, if you will. And when we zoom into that a little bit more, what you're going to see is the individual processing stages inside. I mentioned that on the UADP 2.0 and 3.0, we have a 17 stage ingress programmable pipeline, an eight stage egress programmable pipeline. You can see those blocks in there called IGR and EGR. These stand for ingress global resolution and egress global resolution. So these are the blocks that figure out what to do with the packet once all those stages have processed it because one stage could have said rewrite the QoS information into DSCP value. Another stage might have said drop it because it matches an ACL. So those blocks figure out what to do with it at each stage. Again, we're running packet through this programmable pipeline in the highest end UADP 3.0 at over a billion packets per second. So that is just an incredible level of performance we're able to achieve here with all this flexibility and programmability. And as I mentioned, we also take this uh, downscale as well with something like the UADP 2.0 Mini. The UADP 2.0 Mini, we did something pretty interesting. We actually embedded the CPU into the ASIC as well. So we took ARM core CPUs and embedded those into the UADP ASIC. This helps to reduce the price point of the switch and gets this technology this flexibility down to an even lower price point so we can get it into more places in the network and you can deploy it in more places. Now we're not only doing innovation in uh, wired networking, we're also doing innovation in wireless as well. And we actually, Cisco actually has a long history of this. If you take a look at all the things we've introduced, clean air, hyper location, flexible radio assignment, intelligent capture, all the things that we've done is we've continued to evolve our access point product line one of the things I want to talk about here is a really interesting innovation that we come up with called the Cisco RF ASIC. And this is a, a cutaway version that I have here of an AP, uh, nine, uh, this is an AP9120. And uh, I'll draw your attention on here if I flip over to the back side of this to a little board up here, a little red board that you can see. And this little red board is actually called the Cisco RF ASIC. So what the RF ASIC is, is a, a custom piece of silicon that we built into the access point for doing 
processing of wireless traffic. So with this, we're able to do uh, many different things. For example, one of the things that we do in wireless is a thing called dynamic frequency selection, which means that we also have to automatically be looking at the channels that we're on and making sure that we avoid certain channels where other things may be present, like radar signals, for example. Now, normally in all our other access points, we would have done this in software only, meaning that we'd have to hop off channel in order to determine if we've got interference. Uh, here we can actually leverage hardware like the RF ASIC, which will allow us to do this uh, and increase the performance of the AP because we're able to do this in hardware. Again, here's a little close up of where this chip lives in some of our latest uh, access points like the 9120 and the 9130. Now we've built a lot of, as we typically do, we've built a lot of functionality into the silicon. We've only realized a fraction of this functionality in software so far. One of the things that we will be able to do as we go forward is turn on even more and more functions that we built into silicon with more and more features on the access point. That's one of the really cool things about building things in hardware is we can build in functionality. The software may not even leverage right away, but over time we're able to leverage more and more of that capability that we built into the silicon. So the RF ASIC is a really interesting addition into our wireless product line that gives us a, a really cool set of capabilities. Now, one of the things you probably heard about at the keynote yesterday, and you've heard Cisco talking about this for the last short while, is this new chip that we've developed it's called Cisco Silicon One. This is a, a new ASIC that we've developed, very high-end ASIC, that we're basing our Cisco 8000 router series on for service provider networks and for web scale networks, meaning things like massively scalable data centers, for example. So when you take a look at the Cisco Silicon One chip, and I put up there a URL where you can go watch a YouTube video, about this chip. There's a few things that I'll call to your attention here. The first one would be around performance. This particular piece of silicon can handle up to 10 terabits per second. That is an astonishing amount of, of, of uh, throughput. The highest throughput that we get through the UADP chip that I talked about earlier, uh, the highest end version of this is a 1.6 terabit chip. Here we are on the service provider side, we need to go to the next level of performance, and this is a 10 terabit chip. Now to put that in context, yeah, that would mean that if everybody, let's say, in the city of Vancouver, where I'm from, I'm from Canada, if everybody from the city of Vancouver was simultaneously streaming a high-definition Netflix video or, or a video off Prime, uh, what you'd see is that you know, if every single person, a couple of million people in the city, was streaming a move, that high-definition movie simultaneously, all of that could go through a single one of these ASICs. So very, very high performance but also very key down here, you'll see on the bottom, programmable using a language called P4. P4 stands for Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. Again, that's a good acronym you should go home and quiz your family on tonight. Uh, this basically means that just like we talked about the programmability in the UADP chip, this ASIC as well uh, is also fully programmable and that's very, very exciting, again, for use in a service provider context, not just in an enterprise context as we'd see with the, the UADP and the ASIC. So lots of interesting stuff going on in silicon. But at the end of the day, we have to think, what does this all mean for me, right? What, what does this all, it's very, very cool that we talked about ASICs, and I hope that, again, I've communicated some information, maybe a few things about ASICs you didn't know, uh, but also, my, hopefully I've communicated my passion for this. But at the end of the day, what does this all mean? And the real concept here that I think is very important is that our programmable hardware really provides for flexibility and adoptability. Flexibility to adapt to new protocols and new functions over time, which increases adoptability because now as, new as we create new things like software-defined access, you can actually adopt those in your network. Think about, for example, if you'd bought the first Catalyst 3850, switch off of the line in January 2013, you would still be able to use, we didn't ship software-defined access as a solution until 2017, over four and a half years later. But if you bought the first Catalyst 3850 in 2013, you would be able to use software-defined access on it with VXLAN encapsulation and, and uh, SGT tagging at Cisco TrustSec four and a half years later. That's what I mean by adoptability. We develop a new solution, we come up with a new solution, and you're able to adopt that and use that in your network. That's why this is really key on this concept of going to intent-based networking, is because this allows us to effectively create new solutions, 
which we can roll out in software, which you can then adopt into your network and operate at hardware speeds. So that's what I mean by the focus of innovation, moving from software or from hardware to software, we've built a flexible hardware base that now we can support innovation at the speed of software on top of it. So ASICs really form a critical role here, this critical role of flexibility in silicon, because ASICs are the foundations for products, which ultimately are the foundations for solutions, which also ultimately is what provides benefits in our networks. It all starts with that ASIC silicon at the bottom, because that is really providing the, the, the strong foundation on which the products and the solutions are based. Just like the foundation for a building, this provides a strong foundation on which all of our solutions build. That's why ASICs are so key, and why you constantly hear our, our uh, executives talking about the importance of ASICs and the importance of, of silicon. This is why it's so important. Now, if you want to know more about ASICs, I actually uh, teach a course here at Cisco Live with my compatriot, Peter Jones, we teach a course called Cisco Silicon, the importance of hardware in a software defined world. It's actually happening tomorrow morning. And we subtitle that session from the gates to the GUI. Because what we do in that session is we really move from the gates, silicon gates, remember we started off talking about those, up to all the benefits that we drive through our GUI based architectures that we have today. So with that, I will wrap up the session. Uh, thank you for attending. I really hope you enjoy your time at Cisco Live and all the different sessions and information that's made available to you here. And uh, I look forward to talking to you more about A6 in future. Between human trafficking and a future without fear, there's Vanessa Russell. Cisco, the bridge to possible. As in so many cities, for Kyoto, tourism is a very big deal. But tourism means people. And with so many of them, the city had its hands full. Kyoto didn't just have to get better at managing them all. It had to get smarter. And with Cisco's help, that's exactly what happened. Strategically located smart kiosks now connect tourists with a concierge who can steer them to less congested attractions. So crowds are more evenly distributed. Smart street lighting monitors foot traffic automatically controls brightness when and where it's needed most, and pinpoints outages in real time. So repairs can be made faster. And with special terminals monitoring multiple cameras, data can be compared simultaneously, making the city safer than ever before. As for the people of Kyoto and the millions of tourists who visit every year, they have just one thing to say about their new smart city. We can't wait to see what's next. Between ancient and smart, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Electricity is always there. We don't worry about it. We don't think about it. Never do we think about an attack on the power grid. It is like this all over the world. It is like this in Finland. Turku Energia supplies electricity for hundreds of thousands of people. Because its operations network was independent from IT, an attack could have found its way into the grid and no one would have known. 
until it was too late. By extending the IT network out to operations, Cisco was able to help secure the entire system, both now and in the future. And with Cisco IoT technology, the new virtually fail-proof system is as reliable as it is secure, one unified network. It's why tonight in Turku, life will go on like it always has and always will. Between on and always on, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. For years, we've been hearing about IoT. Ooh, look, my cat just woke up. Let me put the lights on for her. It's time to get real. This is about big industry changing things, complex things. It's about a network of things that includes this, and these, and that thing, and whatever this is. You've got more data than you can shake a stick at, and that stick generates data too. This is industrial strength IoT. It connects turbines to power grids, pipeline operations to refineries, first responders to life-saving devices. It's a big challenge, and it makes a difference to our lives. So how do you meet it head on? Not like this, like this. Only Cisco can securely connect tens of thousands of assets at the farthest edge of your network to the heart of your business, no matter the scale. With security built in, not bolted on, and a flexible network to grow as your business expands. Now, IT's happy, ops are happy, innovation is accelerated, business is transformed, lives are improved. Between big ideas and big results, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. This is the data center, and it deals with demand. Demand that's coming from anywhere, any place, any device. Billions of things, millions of apps, clouds of all kinds. Demands for capacity, for analytics, for real-time insights, giving customers exactly what they want. And it's all landing right here. But that's okay, because you're not just waiting for it. You've got ACI Anywhere, a remote control that gives you the power to answer any need, choose any cloud, manage and secure any demand right from here. So tell them to bring it on. You're ready, anytime, anywhere. Cisco ACI goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The power is here. And here. But also here. And definitely here. Anywhere you need the full force and power of your infrastructure, hyper-converged. It's like having thousands of data centers, wherever you need them, powering applications anywhere they live, but managed from the cloud. So you can automate everything from here. Cisco HyperFlex goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. National Instruments had a predicament. Bandwidth demands were on the increase. And while growth is good, their IT budget wasn't keeping pace. Not so good. IT needed to deliver more bandwidth to offices around the world while keeping spending under control. That's not so easy. Suddenly, the company that helps engineers accelerate innovation found themselves needing help. Oh, and it needs to be fast, flexible, affordable, and secure too. A tall order, but by no means an impossible one. Not with the decision to turn to us, the people who invented the network in the first place. Using a Cisco SD-WAN solution in Cisco services, we massively increased their bandwidth. Where their budget held them back, we propelled them forward. Now most companies would be delighted right there, but we went further. Network deployments are faster than ever. And where their old network generated problem tickets faster than anyone could count, the number of WAN-related tickets has decreased 70% in the past year. All of this to prove that between those frozen processes of yours and free-flowing productivity, there's a bridge. Tell us what you're imagining, and we will build the bridge to get you there. Stel je voor, de eerste zijde uit China. Kruiden uit Indië. 
Day, River, de Suiker. Al de rijkdom van de wereld kwam hier, in deze plaats. For over 500 years, the lifeblood of commerce has flowed in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Today, it's on a scale and at a speed never before imagined, until now. There is a lot at stake. We have vessels entering the dangerous cargo. We have very large container carriers. If one gets stuck in the entrance, the entire harbor is jammed. Consequences, safety-wise and economically, are immense if something goes wrong. The logistics are easy, but uh, to make the puzzle work, that is complicated. Making the puzzle work is a network of sensors spread across the port's 41 square miles, providing terabits of data. 200 calculations a minute. Wind, tides, currents, and visibility to help guide 130,000 ships a year and protect 468 million tons of cargo. In my function, in my job, the security is the main thing. If we have the right data and the reliability is proven, we can predict what the situation will be three, four, five hours in advance, and we can plan with that. After careful evaluation and planning, Everything is, is possible in Rotterdam, and that's uh, the thing we are, we are proud of. The confidence to run Europe's largest port, and one company delivers all that sensor data safely, delivers all that data securely. Between the storied past and a modern efficiency the Dutch would call... Oh, lovely. There's a bridge. Cisco the bridge to possible. Here's a question. In a world where data goes everywhere, where does that put your data center? At the moment, trends are born, greeting customers with every detail they need. At the point where all your clouds meet and share, but also on watch, securing everything and everyone. In an uncentered world, you need a data center that extends to every branch, every device, every cloud, everywhere. The Cisco data center goes everywhere your data is. Between data everywhere and exactly where you need it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There is something unique about our baby's cry. Like no other sound, it stirs our instinct to nurture and protect. Unfortunately, those cries sometimes go unheard. Because in some neonatal wards in Uganda, there isn't enough equipment or staff. Now those cries can be heard with the help of a wearable monitor that displays critical information for each baby, enabling nurses to immediately respond with the proper care. This life-saving technology was developed by Neopenda, a medical device company serving emerging markets and underserved people. Cisco's support helped Neopenda further develop the technology that connects its devices. This is one more example of how Cisco empowers social entrepreneurs to use innovative technology to make the world better. Between a baby's cry and a nurse's care, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The Ellen Show is the number one daytime talk show in America. By far, the biggest thing we do all year is our Mother's Day event. It's so much fun and our fans just love it. We spend a lot of time aligning the show with brands that want to be a part of the Ellen experience. Hey guys! Hey New York! Hi! Hi. There were a bunch of moms-to-be all over the country who tried to get tickets but they could not get tickets. We're usually working on a really tight schedule. The faster we can launch or join meetings, the better. 
Hi. I am going to use Cisco video technology to surprise them. I don't want to surprise the baby out of you, but surprise! Some of us are in LA, some of us are in New York. There's an enormous amount of collaboration that goes on between us. And it really doesn't matter if we're on a laptop in our office or on the lot. We're back and so far no one in the audience has gone into labor, but we're just getting started. Because we don't always have things nailed down until the last minute, communication becomes a really big deal. Being able to share, tweak, and review Microsoft Office documents within WebEx teams and actually see those changes as they're being made, that's huge. We do hundreds of integrations every year. So we've gotten to the point where if we weren't using WebEx Teams, it would just slow the whole process down. With Cisco WebEx Teams, we know this is going to be the best Mother's Day show ever. Between teamwork and the biggest show of the year. Be kind to one another. Happy Mother's Day. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every day, every night, everywhere. People are living on the streets. We see it. We all know it's a problem. But what can we do? In Brisbane, Australia, two young mates decided to do something. They would start small. They decided not to call them homeless. They would call them friends. Then, they outfitted a van with a washer, dryer and a shower and hit the streets of Brisbane to wash their friends' clothes. Orange Sky was born. One van quickly became two, then four, then 20. The operation, staff, logistics needed to scale and quickly. So Orange Sky found a partner. Cisco tailored a Meraki network that can grow as they grow. Intuitive dashboards at the head office and robust Wi-Fi in every vehicle let Orange Sky monitor vans and onboard devices remotely via the cloud. Cisco WebEx connects leaders in real time with staff and volunteers, whose energy and enthusiasm is essential to the model's success. What happened? Something wonderful. While friends waited for their clothes to wash and dry, they talked. A simple connection, joining a community, perhaps for the first time in years. If one load of laundry can do that, who knows what's possible? Between cleaning clothes and creating a community, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When mankind took its first steps on the moon, the images were captured with a lens made by Zeiss. When precision is in question, in manufacturing, science, medicine, anything, the answer, accurate to 200 billionths of a meter, is provided by Zeiss. Getting it right. Getting it precisely right. For nearly two centuries, Zeiss has set the standard for industrial precision and optic excellence. Looking forward. Looking further. And innovating to get there. Now, technology is pushing us faster than ever toward a more connected world. Can Zeiss lead the way? They're already there. Zeiss has partnered with Cisco. Innovation and precision are now online. A team from Cisco Customer Experience working with Zeiss has designed an innovative IoT strategy, setting a new standard for Zeiss connected data. Cisco Kinetic enables Zeiss to securely gather more information than ever, putting it to use in ways never before imagined, predicting performance and protecting uptime. Cisco WebEx brings Zeiss technicians and industrial customers together at a moment's notice, enabling innovation on the fly. The result? More advanced products, happier consumers, increased revenues. What they say is true. They don't make them like they used to. At companies using Zeiss, partnered with Cisco, they make them better between precision and the pace of business, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
I was running the plumbing business. It was great. We prospered and things were well. And then I got hurt and the spiral began. Every night across America, a half million people go to sleep homeless. When you're in the street, you are invisible. You're, you're out there, nobody sees you. You have to make hard choices, really hard choices. As unimaginable as that is, even more are at risk of becoming homeless. There are homeless from every profession, plumbers, electricians, doctors, financiers, a quantum physicist. Which is why we're committed to help put a roof over the heads of those who need one most. And for those at risk, helping them keep theirs. With all the homeless people out there, we were chosen for an apartment. It's better than the lottery. This is a place to live. Together, let's be the bridge to a place called home. I don't know you, but I love you for what you've done and how you helped me. Technology. There's never been more potential at your fingertips. But technology is only half the picture. Introducing Cisco Customer Experience. We're here to help you get the most out of your technology. Because behind the billions of connections, we believe there needs to be a relationship. Someone who can position you for continuous innovation. Someone who can help you design a roadmap for your next five weeks or your next five years. Someone who can be with you from whiteboard to reality. We'll help you transform not just your technology, but your business. We understand that your customers expect a lot of you, and we're here to help you deliver. Innovating, creating, delivering, transforming with the right people and the right technology together. This is Cisco Customer Experience. Between technology and where it can take you, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Technology often comes down to a choice. This or that. Do you need 5G or Wi-Fi 6? Mobility or security? Should you be in the cloud or a data center? Do you need this gen or next? The answer to all these questions is yes. Now you don't have to choose because there's one network that's ready for anything. It's called intent-based networking and it's only from Cisco. A system built for Wi-Fi 6? Yes. And ready for 5G? Yes. And the numerous machine languages of the IoT? Yes. What about security and threat detection? VR, AR, AI? The answer to your question is yes. Intent-based networking from Cisco. Wireless first, cloud-driven, data optimized. Between what's now and what's next, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
Welcome to Cisco Live. Thank you for watching our talk. I am Gabriel Zapodanu, Technical Marketing we Engineer with Cisco Business Unit and Fry Center Business Unit. Today with me I have David Hunt. Thank you, Gabby, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the Technical Architect for Cisco's Technical Experience Team, so thrilled to be here. During our talk, we are going to cover briefly REST APIs and webhooks. We will show you how to configure Cisco DNA Center webhooks. We will share with you how simple it is to create a webhook receiver. We will go over the implementation of webhooks that TechX used in Cisco Live Latin America. And we will share with you how to build additional integrations using webhooks. What is REST API? You probably are seeing a lot of conversations about APIs, and REST APIs is one of the many different types of APIs that us network engineers need to be comfortable with. RESTful APIs use HTTP requests to create, read, update, or delete objects. We can ask a server to create a new resource. We can read information from the server, update existing resources, or delete them. Make REST APIs are very easy. It's very simple to create a new API request. Our client application will start a request, will send it to the server, and the server will respond. The transaction happens very quickly. All the information the server is needing, requires for that request to be successful, will be provided by the client application. There are only a few components that REST APIs required to make it to be successful. One is the URL. We need the application server and the API resource. Of course, application servers could have multiple API endpoints. We need to provide an information to the server to know what resource we are accessing. Most of the times, you are going to need to provide an authentication. That could be most likely HTTP basic, custom OAuth, and there are some platforms that do not require any authentication. The headers. A typical one could be application JSON if we are going to require the server to provide us information in that format. The request body is what we are sending to the server. The client application may need to send the server the uh, a specific data in order for that request to be completed. The method is what we are asking the server to uh, do for us. We may want to create a new resource with post. Get will ask the server to provide us information regarding the resource. With put, we can update the resource, and delete will re delete that resource. Here is a REST API request example. In this, uh, this API request will ask the Cisco DNA Center to provide us information regarding a MAC client, the MAC address of the client at the specific time. The URL is composed from the application server and the resource. The header instructs the server that I'm going to send information using application JSON, and in this case, I'm going to ask the server to provide us the information that we are asking formatted in JSON. The header will include also the authentication that Cisco DNA Center requires. The method is get. I am going to ask the server to send me information in, uh, that is existing regarding this client. Then I will use the Python JSON libraries to parse this response. The response components that are included are going to be always a status code telling us if the requ request has been successful. We may have some client errors or server errors. There will be enough information provided to us to allow us to troubleshoot should something may not happen as we expect. The headers will provide us information regarding the data this is provided to us. It could be JSON or XML formatted data, could be files, or could be uh, also information regarding the date and the UTF encoding. The response body includes the information that we are asking. Here is the example of the REST API response for the request that we presented before. The status code is 200, which means has been successful. The header includes the UTF encoding and the fact that the data is application JSON and the JSON response body. This is what we ask the server to provide to us. There is a lot of information in this payload, however, 
we are going to select only the information that we are interested in. In this case, we are looking for information regarding the IP address of the MAC address uh, client, the host type, the also information regarding the switch, and the access VLAN. In a summary, the REST API request and response exchange is very simple. The URL, the header, and the client, the method get will be sent to the server that composes the request. The response includes all the information the server has about that client. That response is going to be assigned to the client response variable, which we will parse using JSON to select only the information that is important for us. Let's look at the demo of how to send the REST API request to Cisco DNA Center. Here on the assurance page for the client 360 view, we have the information regarding the client, MAC address, switch that is connected to, and the access VLAN. This is the sample code that will be used to send the API request. The function getClientInfo includes all the information and the steps required to make this API request successful. This is the output that has been provided by Cisco DNA Center and the information that we selected from the output. There is a lot more information that Cisco DNA Center provided to us regarding the client. What about webhooks? Sometimes they are called reverse APIs. Unlike uh, REST APIs where the client application will send the request to a server, webhooks, the server will notify the client application. They are event-driven and will send data when needed. They typically use POST or PUT methods to a receiver URL. There will be an OFF method that could be basic OFF or a variety of different other things like API keys, integration keys, or maybe no authentication required. Webhooks are very simple to use and lightweight. In this case, the application server will send a webhook, a notification to a receiver, followed by the receiver accepting and uh, 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 sending a status code that is received that webhook. In a summary, webhooks and REST APIs in many ways similar. However, there are significant differences between them as well. REST APIs are used by clients to interact with servers. Webhooks are used by servers to publish data to clients. They both use post and put methods. There are slightly different in a way that typically the client will send the request to the server in case of REST APIs, and the webhook is the data will be sent from the server to the client. They are a pull model and a push model. Let's look over how we can configure Cisco DNA Center webhooks. To configure Cisco DNA Center webhooks, we need to go first to the platform, followed by developer toolkit, followed by events. We will have a list of a variety of different events that we can subscribe uh, notifications to. In our case, we are going to subscribe to notifications to the event interface connecting network interfaces is down. This is obviously a critical event that we want to be notified real time. We will click subscribe. And then we will have access to the screen where we can actually configure the WIFO. There are only a few different things that we need to configure. Name the subscription. The type of subscription in this case is REST. Define the defin uh, URL where we are going to send the webhook. The method is going to be post. And provide the basic auth authorization that the destination receiver expects. And then we will subscribe. With only these few steps, we can subscribe to one event or multiple events. This is a typical Cisco DNA Center webhook sample payload for assurance events. There is the instance ID, which is the unique identifier for this issue. The type of event, it is a non-fabric wired, and the number that matches to the webhook uh, event that we just configured. It will give us also details regarding the network device that triggered this event, the timestamp in epoch time, and details regarding the interface that has been detected as being down. 
Let's look at the, how webhooks can be sent from Cisco DNA Center to a receiver. We will review the configuration that we described earlier, platform, developer toolkit, and we are going to look for the event 251 for interfaces uh, down between network devices. The webhook PA is for Python Anywhere, and this webhook it has been configured to send notifications from Cisco DNA Center to Python Anywhere to a Flask receiver. This is the Flask receiver configuration. It's a very basic Flask uh, configuration uh, running application on Python Anywhere that provides uh, us the ability to send notifications using webhooks. We are going to trigger an event shutting down the interface Gigabit Ethernet 105. On Python Anywhere, on the console, we can see the webhook that has been received and the further steps that you are going to see in the next few slides during another use case. Highlighted is the webhook. All the information from uh, Cisco DNA Center that is relevant regarding this issue is provided to the receiver. We are going to use this information to create integrations and alert us using a variety of different notification systems like WebEx Teams or PagerDuty. How to build a webhook-based integration? The webhook payload and the off options may not match the destination. The source may send us data like what you are seeing here on the left-hand side and the destination like Jira Cloud or PagerDuty may expect the data or the authentication to be uh, provided in a different format. Because of this, we need to convert the payload and also the, uh, build the off required by the destination. These operations can be done on an application like a simple webhook receiver that I'm going to share with you. This application needs to have a web framework to support REST APIs. It can run on a Linux container, virtual machine, or cloud. It needs to be reachable from Cisco DNA Center and can reach the platforms we desire to integrate with. Flask is a micro web framework for Python. It's a very easy application to learn. It's very popular. It includes all the libraries required to build this framework. It supports backend integrations with databases and other applications. Setup is really very fast and it's simple. It takes only five minutes. And even for those like us, I am not a developer, I'm a network engineer, uh, we can do it in very, uh, uh, literally with very little effort. The Flask application, in my case, will run on Python Anywhere. The reason I'm using Python Anywhere is because it is very easy to set up. I need to be able to reach Python Anywhere from a variety of our cloud platforms. Also, it does support fully Flask applications and databases, it has great documentation and tutorials. This is the web application dashboard. I can see here information regarding my application, how many hits per month, statistics for day. I have access also to troubleshoot my application looking at server logs or access logs, and also I have the options to configure this application from this dashboard. Next, we are going to turn to Dave to share with us his use case of uh, how they deployed uh, webhooks during Cisco Live Cancun. All right, thank you, Gabby. You know, and thank you for letting me be here. You know, uh, the, I'm part of the technical experiences team. That means that we end up uh, building these networks for Cisco Live uh, Cisco Live Cancun, Cisco Live uh, uh, San Diego, as, as well as others. So I, I just quickly want to talk about who we are, what we do, and of course, the, the deployment, the need that we have for, for the automated tools so we can monitor and troubleshoot much more efficiently. We need to, we build these entire networks um, from, you know, within a very short period of time, within five days. So this, this slide I'm really just showing is what is our charter? Uh, the technical experience, you know, option, we have to build a network that's secure. This very broadcast is being sent over 
the enterprise network that, we, that, that a team like ours builds. We don't actually do the Cisco Live Europe team, we do all the other Cisco Lives, but this is a, it has to be a reliable network they build. That means that registration has to work, that the Wi-Fi, the attendee Wi-Fi must work, but at the same time, we want to make the network part of the demo. So we've introduced a technology, there's one here today called Open Roaming. We, it's, it's, it's latest, greatest technology. So we get a, a chance to showcase what Cisco does and the latest technologies do at the same time providing these very secure communication, right? The secure network that we must have. So quickly, this gives an overview of some of the topologies that we build. These are the largest ones that we have. Cisco Live San Diego this last June was stretched along a mile, a mile long of Bayfront property there in San Diego that, that we had to, in several different hotels in several different locations. Um, then we moved to Cisco Live Cancun, which we're going to talk about the successes we had with webhooks there. But again, uh, another property stretching along a seafront property, multiple hotels, indoor and outdoor, that, that provided the backdrop for Cisco Live there. And then we move to Cisco, we have, we have our, our impact. This is our sales event that we have. Very large, again, uh, 97 IDFs, uh, 580 access you know, switches that are involved in there. Uh, huge number of access points, uh, approximately 800 access points deployed there. And then we have our event that we're going to event, we're going to attend this very next month that I hope to, uh, again, bring more of our tools that you've helped us provide here in Melbourne. And that's a, an event right there in, the, in downtown Melbourne and a, a new convention, uh, a new convention center there. So, uh, uh, sorry about that. So, why do we need these? It's, it's important to know that, you know, we're about five guys that work on this full time. Five guys to configure, manually touch, uh, each and every one of these switches, it, literally into the thousands at times, let alone the access points, the controllers, the internet edge, all this stuff we need to actually build up rather rapidly. We have, uh, after this event here, we'll be moving into Melbourne, which is less than four weeks away. So we need to be efficient with our time and automation is, is necessity. And then when we're on site, this is where Webhooks comes in into a key highlight, is that we, we need to be able to be, you know, proactive rather than reactive. So with that, we, uh, we, you know, we, let me show you what we did in uh, Latin America. Uh, we, we have implemented a, a, the Cisco DNA solution using webhooks. We put this up onto a Teams page that all our, our members, not only the five guys that do this full time, but the, the 15 volunteers, the best and brightest that Cisco has, our systems engineers that we bring in to help us with this, we can monitor, monitor each one of these events that happen. And with that, during this four day event, we had almost 5,000 network issues that, that were brought forward. Some of them, you know, just minor, someone unplugged a device because they were moving that device around, interface goes down, it's important to know this is happening. Something unique with this, you know, Latin America is that we actually, um, we, we actually move and readjust the rooms from day to day. And when that happens, sometimes, you know, it's just unplugging the switch. But this next example was kind of unique for us. We noticed that we were seeing interface flapping, messages coming up, something that without webhooks, we wouldn't have been able to be proactive. Usually when the Cisco knock that we are show up on site, uh, the, the user looks at us and thinks, oh no, what did I do wrong? Not, oh, they're here to help typically. Not when they're not called in to help. So in our case, we showed up on site and here we were, we saw this interface flapping, two of our engineers went up onto the, into the, the office and said, we, we think we have an issue. And it was the testing center. The last thing we want is our customers to be in the middle of a, a CCI exam and the testing center is, you know, is, is having issues, right? That would, be, that would be horrible. So we showed up up there. What we didn't know is that we didn't, we didn't pay attention to the testing center's hours. They had closed early that day and they were doing upgrades and machines were upgrading and, and power cycling and ports were going up and down, but it was an expected behavior. But we got to be proactive with that. We've got to be the network that we wanted to be, that we see problems before the user knows or was even aware these kind of things were going on. So we were, we were uh, li to say the least, very excited and Webhooks showed its true value for us. So with that, I'm. I'm going to hand it back to you, Gabby. Thank you, Dave. The part that is very interesting is 
that actually we talked in uh, like probably mid-September about webhooks and uh, the use case and the proof of concept that I developed. And then uh, later, maybe about a month, you have a full application stack ready for production, tested, and be able to take full advantage of these capabilities during Cisco Live Cancun. Oh, and it showed too. It's, it, it is very fast for us to innovate and integrate using these kind of applications. And next I'm going to share with you how to build these integrations. Of course, webhooks are great, but we need to use them. And in this uh, next section, I'm going to share with you how we can build an integration between webhooks from Cisco DNA Center to a variety of different systems, like PagerDuty for notifications, Jira, Cloud Service Desk uh, for uh, IT ticketing, and WebEx Teams. You are going to see that it will take only a few seconds from the moment that Cisco DNA Center detects an issue. We are going to have a ticket created in Jira. We are going to be able to send notifications using uh, webhooks to a variety of different platforms. You are going to send notifications to WebEx Teams and PagerDuty. Also, this enables us to do other things. We can log all the received notifications for as long as we need. We are going to be able to build reports, dashboards, training, or even analyze them and be able to proactively detect issues that could become chronic over time. It will allow us to have much better accuracy and a lot of different enable us for a lot of different innovation in time. The webhook receiver, in my case, runs on Python Anywhere it will receive notifications from the Cisco DNA Center. Once the notification is received, it will be processed and the data transformation will select only the information that is important to create a JIRA service desk ticket. Using the service uh, ticket, we are going to send a notification to PagerDuty. This notification will include links to the ticket system and the issue and to the Cisco DNA Center issue details. We are always going to send also notifications to a WebEx teams like the one that you had during Cancun, so the network operators are aware of these new issues. Also, this webhook receiver will publish REST APIs that allow me to get access to all the logs received from all the webhooks, be able to integrate with additional systems like voice assistant platforms. Here is a sample of what the ITSM uh, integration looks to Jira Cloud Service Desk. It includes a brief description of the ticket, a description of the problem, and the link to the Cisco DNA Center issue details. By accessing that link, we will have access to the Cisco DNA Center uh, details for this issue where we can find out more information about the issue. The Cisco WebEx team notification, uh, in this case, I have two different notifications that has been received. One is for an interface down, a second one is for a power failure on a catalyst switch. We have here also a bot where we can ask the basically the receiver how many notifications have been received today, and we had 11. These are a couple of screenshots for the pager duty notifications. One is on the mobile app, and the other is on the web page. Both include, obviously, the link to the JIRA issue details, and very important, the link to the Cisco DNA Center issue details. Let's go over a quick demo. We are going to trigger an event by shutting down an interface. I'm using a script using NetConf to disable this interface. We are going to see that in a few seconds, we are going to get a notification on WebEx Teams that the new event has been detected. From WebEx Teams, we have access to the DNA Center issue details and the incident in JIRA. Accessing the JIRA event details, the issue details, we are going to have information regarding a brief description of the problem, and the link to the Cisco DNA Center issue details that allows us to continue our troubleshooting. The assurance event details gives us even more details regarding the issue, the network devices that are connected, and the opportunity to run troubleshooting commands on Cisco DNA Center to troubleshoot this problem. For 
demonstration purposes, I'm going to run the configuration commands. I'm going to find out the interface configurations on both ends of the interface that is down. PagerDuty has information regarding the event, and it is convenient for uh, those customers that have PagerDuty to observe uh, how they can use PagerDuty to collect information from the JIRA ticket or the Cisco DNA Center issue details. Those links are provided. In a summary, Cisco DNA Center Assurance Real-Time Event Notifications enable us to build integrations using webhooks. They enable IT organizations to become proactive and provide us access to full issue details and the suggested actions. The sample code for the use case that I presented today can be found in this uh, repository on GitHub. This repository is part of the GitHub Cisco Enterprise Networking Programmability Organization. This organization includes a lot of our use cases and sample code that you may find useful when you use uh, the REST APIs provided by Cisco DNA Center. There are a few other resources that you have available to learn about APIs and how to use APIs with Cisco DNA Center. Those are on the Enterprise Network Programmability YouTube channel where we publish videos with demos of how you can access information that is available on Cisco DNA Center. There are a lot of other resources that are hosted by DevNet with a lot of code on code exchange or automation exchange. Also, using the DevNet sandboxes, you can start your troubleshooting, your development efforts without investing in your own lab. Thank you for joining us today, and should you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter, or you can find the information on how to reach me, or submit uh, questions on the Cisco Enterprise Networking GitHub organization, or the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Dave. Gabby. <laughs>
that really kind of resonated with me and housing was one of the best ways that we could address that in a way that would pull our entire team together. We're building a house for a family of seven. They have five kids, two adults. They are just a phenomenal couple and they've had a lot of kind of hardships in life. It's pretty amazing to see team members from all over who are showing up to support this family that they've never met before. And the sense of camaraderie that we have when we're on the ground together. I think we have the opportunity to do something massive to change the world. Whether it's building a house or whether it's solving hunger, we need to step up. That's, that's really it. Between building a house and building a life, there's Joy Bradley. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Domino's customers have one thing in common when placing an order. They're hungry. They want their pizza, and they want it ASAP, if not sooner. So Domino's began looking for ways to simplify the ordering process. That's when they called Cisco. From the data center to the store, Cisco built a secure, scalable infrastructure that helped streamline ordering. In other words, it got hot food to hungry customers faster, no matter what platform they ordered from, while giving Domino's an edge over their competitors. Delicious. Between craving a better experience and delivering it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Wake up in one city, go to sleep in another. Life on the road is relentless. I've been in the music industry for about 15 years now. I've got about 20 tours under my belt. Those tours have taken me all over the world. Tours today rely on tech. This tour relies on Cisco. No matter where we are in the world, when we arrive at the venue, the first question everybody asks is, what's the Wi-Fi password? That's the most crucial piece for setting up our production office and getting to work. We've got over 100 full-time touring staff. Every single one of us uses our phone to communicate with one another. The producers, the dancers, the band, even the lighting trusses communicate with Justin's in-ears over the Cisco Meraki system. So when Justin navigates the stage, they can all move as a unit. There's really no room for error. It needs to work every single time. Cisco gives us the reliable connectivity we need to deliver the best experience possible for Justin's fans. When anybody has a moment to catch a break on tour, the first thing we do is connect with our loved ones. Hi, honey. Anything we can do to feel like we're home. When we are working on the world's best tours, we want the world's best partners, and we're lucky to have Cisco as a partner. It makes our lives so much easier. Between the show and the business, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. I was really good in math and physics. So that was my favorite subject since high school. That's actually how I ended up in engineering. My name is Alfonsine Imanaraguha. I am a consulting engineer at Cisco in the US. But I was born in Rwanda. It was April 6th, 1994. That night, we heard like a loud explosion in the sky. We rushed to listen to our radio, and we learned that president of Rwanda, that his plane was shut down. That was the beginning of the genocide. I was 13 years old. I remember just hiding in, in the bushes, not sleeping at home at night. My dad was like, hide here. I'm going to find another place where we can safely all hide. As soon as my dad left, we immediately overheard the group of militia men say that they just killed him. I didn't feel the ground. I didn't feel the air around me. There was no wind. There was no sun. I was already dead. Eventually, I found my three younger siblings. They were in the orphanage. 
I, at that point, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, but my life has a meaning. Just watching how one person could make a big difference, I started on my nonprofit, Rising Above the Storms. We work with the homeless kids. We help them go back to school. I could have ended on the street. I could have been one of them. And just seeing them actually dreaming, it gives me hope. Doesn't matter how you do it, make a goal to change one life. Seeing how Cisco has enabled me to do something I love so much, it's, I can't imagine a better feeling in this life. Between survival and inspiration, there's Alphonsine Imanaraguha. I myself was a foster child. I've gone through a, a tremendous amount of abuse, and I come from a long line of um, addiction and things like that. I've been a volunteer dance teacher uh, for many, many years, and in 2010, one of my 15-year-old dance students was sexually assaulted in the Bay Area and sold throughout California for a year. What I decided to do in December of 2011 was actually to form Love Never Fails, which is now the nonprofit that is addressing the issue of human trafficking. So the way that I sought out healing was to become active in this space and do something about it. I can tell you that I have so much joy knowing that I get to be a part of the restoration of these women, men, and children. Just commit one hour a week towards that thing that will feed your soul. And I promise you, it will energize you and it will give you uh, the strength to do 10x what you're currently doing uh, because you'll, you'll just know that every moment that you're taking has, uh, has so much meaning to those uh, around you. Between human trafficking and a future without fear, there's Vanessa Russell. Cisco, the bridge to possible. As in so many cities, for Kyoto, tourism is a very big deal. But tourism means people. And with so many of them, the city had its hands full. Kyoto didn't just have to get better at managing them all. It had to get smarter. And with Cisco's help, that's exactly what happened. Strategically located smart kiosks now connect tourists with a concierge who can steer them to less congested attractions. So crowds are more evenly distributed. Smart street lighting monitors foot traffic, automatically controls brightness when and where it's needed most, and pinpoints outages in real time so repairs can be made faster. And with special terminals monitoring multiple cameras, data can be compared simultaneously, making the city safer than ever before. As for the people of Kyoto and the millions of tourists who visit every year, they have just one thing to say about their new smart city. We can't wait to see what's next. Between ancient, and smart. There's a bridge. Cisco. The bridge to possible. Electricity is always there. We don't worry about it. We don't think about it. Never do we think about an attack on the power grid. It is like this all over the world. It is like this in Finland. Turku Energia supplies electricity for hundreds of thousands of people. Because its operations network was independent from IT, an attack could have found its way into the grid and no one would have known. 
until it was too late. By extending the IT network out to operations, Cisco was able to help secure the entire system, both now and in the future. And with Cisco IoT technology, the new virtually fail-proof system is as reliable as it is secure, one unified network. It's why tonight in Turku, life will go on like it always has and always will. Between on and always on, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. For years, we've been hearing about IoT. Ooh, look, my cat just woke up. Let me put the lights on for her. It's time to get real. This is about big, industry-changing things, complex things. It's about a network of things that includes this, and these, and that thing, and whatever this is. You've got more data than you can shake a stick at, and that stick generates data too. This is industrial strength IoT. It connects turbines to power grids, pipeline operations to refineries, first responders to life-saving devices. It's a big challenge, and it makes a difference to our lives. So how do you meet it head on? Not like this, like this. Only Cisco can securely connect tens of thousands of assets at the farthest edge of your network to the heart of your business, no matter the scale. With security built in, not bolted on, and a flexible network to grow as your business expands. Now, IT's happy, ops are happy, Innovation is accelerated. Business is transformed. Lives are improved. Between big ideas and big results, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. This is the data center, and it deals with demand. Demand that's coming from anywhere, any place, any device. Billions of things, millions of apps, clouds of all kinds, demands for capacity, for analytics for real-time insights, giving customers exactly what they want. And it's all landing right here. But that's okay, because you're not just waiting for it. You've got ACI Anywhere, a remote control that gives you the power to answer any need, choose any cloud, manage and secure any demand right from here. So tell them to bring it on. You're ready, anytime and anywhere. Cisco ACI goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The power is here, and here, but also here, and definitely here. Anywhere you need the full force and power of your infrastructure, hyper-converged. It's like having thousands of data centers, wherever you need them, powering applications anywhere they live, but managed from the cloud, so you can automate everything from here. Cisco HyperFlex goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. National Instruments had a predicament. Bandwidth demands were on the increase. And while growth is good, their IT budget wasn't keeping pace. Not so good. IT needed to deliver more bandwidth to offices around the world while keeping spending under control. That's not so easy. Suddenly, the company that helps engineers accelerate innovation found themselves needing help. Oh, and it needs to be fast, flexible, affordable, and secure, too. A tall order, but by no means an impossible one. Not with the decision to turn to us, the people who invented the network in the first place. Using a Cisco SD-WAN solution in Cisco services, we massively increased their bandwidth. Where their budget held them back, we propelled them forward. Now most companies would be delighted right there, but we went further. Network deployments are faster than ever. And where their old network generated problem tickets faster than anyone could count, the number of WAN-related tickets has decreased 70% in the past year. All of this to prove that between those frozen processes of yours and free-flowing productivity, there's a bridge. Tell us what you're imagining, and we will build the bridge to get you there. Stel je voor. De eerste zijde uit China. Kruiden uit India. 
Shante, River, de suiker. Alle rijkdom van de wereld kwam hier in deze plaats. For over 500 years, the lifeblood of commerce has flowed in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Today, it's on a scale and at a speed never before imagined. Until now. There is a lot at stake. We have vessels entering the dangerous cargo. We have very large container carriers. If one gets stuck in the entrance, the entire harbor is jammed. Consequences, safety-wise and economically, are immense if something goes wrong. The logistics are easy, but uh, to make the puzzle work, that is complicated. Making the puzzle work is a network of sensors spread across the port's 41 square miles, providing terabits of data. 200 calculations a minute. Wind, tides, currents, and visibility to help guide 130,000 ships a year and protect 468 million tons of cargo. In my function, in my job, the security is the main thing. If we have the right data and the reliability is proven, we can predict what the situation will be three, four, five hours in advance, and we can plan with that. After careful evaluation and planning, Everything is, is possible in Rotterdam, and that's uh, the thing we are, we are proud of. The confidence to run Europe's largest port, and one company delivers all that sensor data safely, delivers all that data securely. Between the storied past and a modern efficiency the Dutch would call... Oh, lovely. There's a bridge. Cisco the bridge to possible. Here's a question. In a world where data goes everywhere, where does that put your data center? At the moment, trends are born, greeting customers with every detail they need. At the point where all your clouds meet and share, but also on watch, securing everything and everyone. In an uncentered world, you need a data center that extends to every branch, every device, every cloud, everywhere. The Cisco data center goes everywhere your data is. Between data everywhere and exactly where you need it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There is something unique about a baby's cry. Like no other sound, it stirs our instinct to nurture and protect. Unfortunately, those cries sometimes go unheard. Because in some neonatal wards in Uganda, there isn't enough equipment or staff. Now those cries can be heard with the help of a wearable monitor that displays critical information for each baby, enabling nurses to immediately respond with the proper care. This life-saving technology was developed by Neopenda, a medical device company serving emerging markets and underserved people. Cisco's support helped Neopenda further develop the technology that connects its devices. This is one more example of how Cisco empowers social entrepreneurs to use innovative technology to make the world better. Between a baby's cry and a nurse's care, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The Ellen Show is the number one daytime talk show in America. By far, the biggest thing we do all year is our Mother's Day event. It's so much fun and our fans just love it. We spend a lot of time aligning the show with brands that want to be a part of the Ellen experience. Hey guys. Hey New York. Hi. Hi. There were a bunch of moms-to-be all over the country who tried to get tickets, but they could not get tickets. We're usually working on a really tight schedule. The faster we can launch or join meetings, the better. 
Hi. I am gonna use Cisco video technology to surprise them. I don't wanna surprise the baby out of you, but surprise! Some of us are in LA, some of us are in New York. There's an enormous amount of collaboration that goes on between us. And it really doesn't matter if we're on a laptop in our office or on the lot. We're back and so far, no one in the audience has gone into labor, but we're just getting started. Because we don't always have things nailed down until the last minute, communication becomes a really big deal. Being able to share, tweak, and review Microsoft Office documents within WebEx teams and actually see those changes as they're being made, that's huge. We do hundreds of integrations every year. So we've gotten to the point where if we weren't using WebEx Teams, it would just slow the whole process down. With Cisco WebEx Teams, we know this is going to be the best Mother's Day show ever. Between teamwork and the biggest show of the year. Be kind to one another. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every day, Every night, everywhere, people are living on the streets. We see it. We all know it's a problem. But what can we do? In Brisbane, Australia, two young mates decided to do something. They would start small. They decided not to call them homeless. They would call them friends. Then, they outfitted a van with a washer, dryer and a shower and hit the streets of Brisbane to wash their friends' clothes. Orange Sky was born. One van quickly became two, then four, then 20. The operation, staff, logistics needed to scale and quickly. So Orange Sky found a partner. Cisco tailored a Meraki network that can grow as they grow. Intuitive dashboards at the head office and robust Wi-Fi in every vehicle let Orange Sky monitor vans and onboard devices remotely via the cloud. Cisco WebEx connects leaders in real time with staff and volunteers, whose energy and enthusiasm is essential to the model's success. What happened? Something wonderful. While friends waited for their clothes to wash and dry, they talked. A simple connection, joining a community, perhaps for the first time in years. If one load of laundry can do that, who knows what's possible? Between cleaning clothes and creating a community, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When mankind took its first steps on the moon, the images were captured with a lens made by Zeiss. When precision is in question in manufacturing, science, medicine, anything, the answer, accurate to 200 billionths of a meter, is provided by Zeiss. Getting it right. Getting it precisely right. For nearly two centuries, Zeiss has set the standard for industrial precision and optic excellence. Looking forward. Looking further. And innovating to get there. Now, technology is pushing us faster than ever toward a more connected world. Can Zeiss lead the way? They're already there. Zeiss has partnered with Cisco. Innovation and precision are now online. A team from Cisco Customer Experience working with Zeiss has designed an innovative IoT strategy, setting a new standard for Zeiss connected data. Cisco Kinetic enables Zeiss to securely gather more information than ever, putting it to use in ways never before imagined, predicting performance and protecting uptime. Cisco WebEx brings Zeiss technicians and industrial customers together at a moment's notice, enabling innovation on the fly. The result? More advanced products, happier consumers, increased revenues. What they say is true. They don't make them like they used to. At companies using Zeiss, partnered with Cisco, they make them better between precision and the pace of business, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
I was running the plumbing business. It was great. We prospered and things were well. And then I got hurt and the spiral began. Every night across America, a half million people go to sleep homeless. When you're in the street, you are invisible. You're, you're out there, nobody sees you. You have to make hard choices, really hard choices. As unimaginable as that is, even more are at risk of becoming homeless. There are homeless from every profession, plumbers, electricians, doctors, financiers, a quantum physicist. Which is why we're committed to help put a roof over the heads of those who need one most. And for those at risk, helping them keep theirs. With all the homeless people out there, we were chosen for an apartment. It's better than the lottery. This is a place to live. Together, let's be the bridge to a place called home. I don't know you, but I love you for what you've done and how you helped me. Technology. There's never been more potential at your fingertips. But technology is only half the picture. Introducing Cisco Customer Experience. We're here to help you get the most out of your technology. Because behind the billions of connections, we believe there needs to be a relationship. Someone who can position you for continuous innovation. Someone who can help you design a roadmap for your next five weeks or your next five years. Someone who can be with you from whiteboard to reality. We'll help you transform not just your technology, but your business. We understand that your customers expect a lot of you, and we're here to help you deliver. Innovating, creating, delivering, transforming with the right people and the right technology together. This is Cisco Customer Experience. Between technology and where it can take you, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Technology often comes down to a choice. This or that. Do you need 5G or Wi-Fi 6? Mobility or security? Should you be in the cloud or a data center? Do you need this gen or next? The answer to all these questions is yes. Now you don't have to choose because there's one network that's ready for anything. It's called intent-based networking and it's only from Cisco. A system built for Wi-Fi 6? Yes. And ready for 5G? Yes. And the numerous machine languages of the IoT? Yes. What about security and threat detection? VR, AR, AI? The answer to your question is yes. Intent-based networking from Cisco. Wireless first, cloud-driven, data optimized. Between what's now and what's next, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
Hello, welcome to the uh, Master Series at Cisco Live in Barcelona. Uh, I hope everybody's having a great Cisco Live so far. And what we're going to talk about in this session, as you can see through a title, is we're going to talk about solving the big problems. We're going to ask and hopefully answer the question about what can a few talented, committed engineers accomplish. So by way of introduction, my name is Dave Zaks. I'm a director of innovation in the Cisco CX team. I focus on many different things inside the company, including flexible hardware, which I talked about earlier today, fabric networks, assurance, machine learning, been with Cisco about 20 years. And um, I hope to have a talk today that is going to be really, really interesting for you and maybe different than any other talk that you're going to see at Cisco Live. So what are we really tackling in this talk today? Well, what I really want to take you on is a bit of an ambitious presentation. This is a, a, a journey that we're going to go on from innovation from the lowest levels in silicon to the highest levels of solutions in networks. And we're going to try to tackle all the way that from the low level to the high level all the way in the next 40 minutes. So let's get started. Uh, let's start with the basics. We're going to start talking about quantum tunneling channel challenges at the seven nanometer process node in silicon. So as you probably know, quantum mechanics dictates that we have a, uh, you know, whenever we have uh, electrical fields in close proximity, that we have leakage between different areas within a semiconductor. What we're going to take a look at is the leakage, we're going to start off with the leakage between multiple gates and multiple drains within a piece of silicon. We're going to examine some of the formulas that are basic uh, constructs in making this work, and specifically we're going to start off by taking a look at this paper, which is the design of 14 nanometer trigate transistors on bulk wafer FinFETs. So, let's get started. Now, you actually think I'm going to talk about that, don't you? I'm not going to talk about that. I'm actually going to talk about something totally different and something that you've probably never seen in a Cisco Live talk before, but I think will be, re I hope will be really, really interesting for you. I'm going to put up an assertion that I strongly believe in, and this assertion consists of five words. It's important to have heroes. I strongly believe that it's important to have heroes in your life, people that you look up to, people that, that embody uh, some of the elements of what you potentially yourself would like to be. Some of my heroes would include people that you would recognize, like Albert Einstein, like Steve Jobs, like Elon Musk. These are all, people all embody different elements that in, in many ways are, are very admirable. And, and you may look up to these as heroes. And we all have our individual heroes. These are, these are some of mine. But what I want to talk about is somebody else who's one of my heroes, somebody else that you're probably not familiar with. Uh, and that person here is this name, Paul Kastenholz. So you're probably not familiar with Paul. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about Paul's background and what he did. And I, as I go through a presentation, I hope to explain to you why he's one of my heroes. Paul was a senior rocket engineer, engineer working at a company called Rocketdyne. So Rocketdyne, and Paul specifically at Rocketdyne, he had a long career in designing the rocket propulsion systems for various different projects. He worked on multiple engines in the Saturn program for Project Apollo that got a man to the moon. He was actually the program manager that developed the space shuttle main engine. So he had a long career in rocketry, and I'm very interested in and, and passionate about, about rocketry. So Paul is one of my heroes, and I hope to explain to you why. Now, as we take a look at what can a few talented, committed engineers accomplish? Who do you think this is a picture of? And most people will look at him and say, well, I recognize that person. That's Paul Bezos, he's the CEO of Amazon. But then I'll put up this picture and say, what is that a picture of? Now, when I saw this picture in publication a few years ago, I was extremely excited when I saw this picture. But what is that a picture of? It looks like a person on the deck of a ship washing off something that looks like a big manhole cover. He's, he's washing that off. When I looked at this, I thought, oh my goodness, look at that. That is uh, uh, the critical component that really got the man to the moon uh, because that is what's called the injector plate from an F1 engine in a Saturn V moon rocket. I was so excited when I saw this picture. Now what's the connection between this critical component from the moon rocket, the injector plate in an F1, and Jeff Bezos? How are those two things connected? Well, Jeff Bezos actually has a company called Bezos Expeditions, and they recovered those F1 engines from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean floor because after, of course, the moon rocket launched, the first stage cuts off, it crashes down into the ocean and sank, and uh, they recovered those off the ocean floor 14,000 feet down. That is, pieces of the rocket are actually visible in museums. There's a museum in Seattle that actually has these components of the rockets that, that you can view. 
So let's examine and talk a little bit about the Saturn V moon rocket. Now, as we're explaining this, I actually brought a Saturn V with me uh, to, the, to the show today. Uh, it's right here, let me grab it. So this is a Lego model that I built of the Saturn V. Uh, it's a complete moon rocket. It actually consists of 1,969 pieces. This was my very first Lego project uh, that I ever built, and I built this over uh, the holidays that have just gone by. So to explain a little bit about this rocket, it's really a three-stage rocket. It consists of three individual stages. And let's take this apart so we can actually see the individual stages here. Here's the third stage that I'm taking off right now. And then this is the second stage. And then we have the first stage here. So let's examine what each one of those stages is, is kind of all about. So it's a three-stage platform. It takes three stages to launch a man uh, to the moon. The complete rocket, as you can see here, weighs about 6.4 uh, million pounds, fully fueled, so about 3,000 tons fully fueled. It has about 7.5 million pounds of thrust in the first stage. So 7.5 million pounds of thrust, 6.4 million pounds of weight, 1.1 million pounds of positive thrust, and, and, and up it goes. So 7.5 million pounds of thrust comes out of five engines in the rocket. Then we have the second stage, which also consists of five engines, but they're a different type of engine called the J2 engine. This is a cryogenic engine. Altogether, they develop about, about a million and a half pounds of thrust. That's out of the second stage here. And then finally, the third stage, which uh, is one, one uh, J1, uh, J2 engine, and this is what actually the, the stage that would take the man to the moon. This component would go into orbit around the Earth. Uh, this stage would actually burn again a second time to launch the person towards the moon. Then they would jettison the third stage, and the lunar module and the servant command service modules would actually, would actually uh, end up going to the moon. So we're gonna talk a lot about the development of this rocket, specifically about the development of the engines on the bottom of the first stage, because that's really what my hero, uh, Paul Kastenholtz, worked on and uh, perfected the rocket engines that are in there. So this vehicle is one of the most complex machines that's ever been built by humans. It had over three million parts in the rocket in total, and stood fully assembled over 363 feet tall. So it's just a massive, massive thing. If we had a human being standing next to this, the human being would be smaller than my fingernail here compared to the total size of this rocket, just to give you some idea of how, how large that actually is. And there was actually challenges between the different teams, the German team and the engineer, American team that were working on developing this rocket in terms of doing what they called man rating, the rocket stack. In other words, how many times do we build this rocket in total before we dare to put a person on top and actually launch it? That's called man rating the rocket. Now, if you take a look at what the commitment that the United States made of getting man to the moon, you had John Kennedy who stood up and said, this country should commit itself before the decade is out to the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. In other words, this is a goal, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth, and this is the goalpost before the decade is out. So in order to actually get to the stage where they could be prepared to launch this complete, very, very complex vehicle to the moon, there's two approaches to engineering that. One would be to build and test the first stage multiple times, then uh, once you've got that perfected, to build and test the second stage multiple times, and then once you've got that perfected, to build and test the third stage multiple times. And if you had unlimited time, you could do that. But we have to get a man on the moon by the end of the decade. So that was just several years to, to, to get it all done, to build and assemble this, this massive rocket. So they moved to a, a system called all-up testing. All-up testing basically says they built the entire rocket stack all at once, all that complexity, and launched it all at the same time, right? So this was the concept of all-up testing, which was really the brainchild of a gentleman named George Mueller, uh, who pushed this concept through uh, to considerable resistance, I might add, initially, inside the organization. But eventually, they had to move to all-up testing to meet this timeline, to meet this goal. So you can imagine the pressure that was on the engineers to achieve such a complex thing in such a short amount of time. Now, the F1 engine on the bottom of the rocket, in particular, was revolutionary, much more revolutionarily bigger than any other engine that had ever been built before. Here's a picture of Werner von Braun, 
who was the uh, father of the Saturn V, the inventor of Saturn V in many ways, next to a picture of just one of the F1 engines. And you can just see the massive scale of, the, of that F1 engine here compared to, to a human being. They're just massively huge. Now we're going to talk a lot about the engineering of the F1 engine, but what I'd really like to do is kind of let the engine speak for itself for just a, a minute or so and let you observe the awesome power of this engine uh, during a liftoff. So let's take a look at that. It's just astounding to see the power of these engines. I never get tired of watching, watching these videos. So the F1 engine was the instrumental component that was used for the first stage engine uh, in moon launch, the, the engines on the bottom of the first stage. And what did this first stage actually do during launch? Well, it launched the entire rocket stack, remember 6.4 million pounds of rocket, 50 miles downrange, 40 miles in altitude, accelerated the rocket up to Mach 7, seven times the speed of sound. It only, it only lasted for two and a half minutes during flight before they would cut off the first stage and go to the second stage. And during that two and a half minutes, it would burn four and a half million pounds of fuel. So it's just kind of astounding that this engine that they created was much bigger than any previous engine. It was on the order of 10x bigger than any engine that had been uh, successfully built before. And it was a massive, massive engineering problem to build something that big. In rocketry, when you increase the power on a rocket by 10 to 20%, you've achieved something fairly significant. Here they were going you know, 500 to 1,000% bigger than the rocket engines that had previously been built. And that's what you have to do in order to get to the moon. It's just, it's just math. You work backwards and say, the, the space capsule weighs this much, the lander weighs this much, uh, and you just do the math and work backwards and you find out that the rocket to get to a moon has to weigh on an order of six to seven million pounds. So it's just a massive, massive structure. So here's a close up view of a little bit of the F1 engine. I'll just point out a few key components to it here. A million and a half pounds thrust per engine. This is the biggest liquid fueled rocket engine even to date that's ever, ever been built. Uh, it had a uh, chamber pressure approaching a thousand PSI inside a thousand pounds per square inch and a temperature inside the combustion chamber approaching 6,000 degrees. So imagine the materials that you have to build this out of to withstand that kind of temperature and pressure. So uh, let's zoom up a little bit on the top of that engine. This is a picture I actually took of the back of one of those engines when I was visiting this at, at uh, Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center. And one of the things I've circled there, if you can see it, it might be a little bit hard to see, but right in the center here, you can see this, this component which is, uh, if you recognize it, is that plate, the, fuel, the injector plate that that person was washing off on the, uh, on the deck of the ship before. That's what sits right at the top of the engine bell, and the injector plate is where the fuel comes together, what we call RP-1 and LOX. RP-1 is rocket propellant one, it's basically a highly refined form of kerosene, and liquid oxygen come together at the injector plate, mix and combust and burn. So the fuel rates through that engine are pretty astounding, uh, 28,000 gallons, or pardon me, 24,000 gallons of uh, liquid oxygen and 15,000 gallons of RP-1 per minute per engine. That type of flow rate, by the time we have five engines on the bottom of the Saturn V, will empty an Olympic-sized swimming pool full of fuel within about three minutes. So it's just an astounding amount of, of, of uh, fuel that has to flow through these injector plates. Now the big problem they had when they developed this engine is it's what we call dynamically unstable. So let me explain a little bit about what that means. When the engine is burning and the fuel is combusting, there are pressure waves that form within the engine bell. This is normal and natural, but the engine waves need to dampen themselves out. The engine, the pressure waves basically need to dampen out in there so that we don't get uh, our self-reinforcing uh, uh, construct going where basically the, if, the end, if the pressure waves start to feed on themselves, 
the engine within a couple of seconds will either melt or explode. And if that's happening below six million pounds of highly volatile rocket fuel, it would instantly be adios rocket, adios astronauts, and because that would be happening live on national TV, adios moon program. So uh, it's very, very important uh, to solve this problem of the instability of these engines. Now, what they do when they're testing engines is they put them onto a test stand out in the desert and they test to see how well does a rocket work. Do we burn it for a few seconds and a few seconds more and a few seconds more up until the full rated thrust of the engine. And in, Jan in June 28, 1962, combustion instability resulted in a total loss of one of these F1 engines. So what that means is when they were putting it on a test stand like this, you can see the big fuel tanks up top and you can see the engine burning at the bottom, just like we saw in the video, that engine burning, they're burning the engine on the bottom there. Uh, one of these engines basically exploded on the test stand, totally destroyed the test stand, fuel everywhere, rocket components everywhere, and uh, if that had happened for real during a launch, it would have been the total loss of, of the rocket. So as Von Braun dryly remarked at that point, this problem of combustion instability assumed new proportions. Right, it's, it's taking, a, taking a gentle stab at it, I suppose. So uh, this problem really got handed to a team led by three people to fix. Jerry Thompson from NASA, my hero Paul Kastenholz, and Dan Klute from Rocketdyne, the company that was actually building uh, the rockets. They have to diagnose the problem, come up with a solution, and test the F1 unit until they can actually certify it as flight ready. Now, this combustion process is too complex to be simulated on a computer, they basically have to resort to seat of the pants engineering, throwing every, all their skill and all their focus at solving this problem. And what's at stake here? If they can't fix this engine, nothing else matters. The entire moon program rests on getting these engines on the bottom of the Saturn V to work and to work reliably. In other words, this is a situation, right? They have to solve the problem. This is a complication, it's too complex to simulate, and this is the implication of what's at stake if they can't fix this problem. Now let's zoom in a little bit more on that. This problem actually took over 24 months to solve, over two years to perfect this engine. But this wasn't just happening in isolation. If we take a look at the timeline here, up to and through the moon, la the moon landings, this was a timeline when they were working on testing and perfecting, if they could perfect it, the F1 engine about that two year period, but all of Project Apollo was going on at the same time. Now I've adjusted the costs here of Project Apollo into today's dollars, and you can see through this graph that at the peak of Project Apollo, it was over $40 billion a year that the moon program was, was, being, was being expended on the moon program. Over $200 billion in total in terms of adjusted dollars. And if they can't get the F1 engine working during this period here, this two year period where they have to basically solve all the problems with it, then none of the rest of this is gonna be possible. There aren't going to be any moon landings. There isn't gonna be a space race. There won't be Skylab. There won't be all the things that, that came out of the Apollo program. And you also have to remember, this wasn't happening in isolation. All the rest of the Apollo program was going on at the same time. The people developing the second stage and the third stage and the lander and the, spa and the Apollo spacecraft, the, the uh, command service module, all that being developed at the same time. The ground support facilities, everything else, uh, all the subcontractors. There were over 400,000 people working on Project Apollo at the peak. But if these three people leading this team can't solve this problem, there's not going to be any moon landing. So imagine the pressure on, on these engineers to, to solve this problem. Now, this didn't, also didn't happen in isolation. It got out into the press that there were problems with the development of the moon rocket. This was public, it wasn't all just happening in private. It was happening very publicly that they had a problem in developing these large rocket engines and getting them to work and to work reliably. So it turned out it was actually useless to try to design the F1 engine so it never went dynamic, so it never went unstable. The engine was too big, there were too many uh, complications, it was subject to too many disturbances inside the engine. They could never dampen out the instabilities entirely. What they needed to do was to move to a concept called dynamic stability, which meant that once the instability started to happen, the engine would automatically correct itself, and they needed to do that within a, a maximum of 400 milliseconds. So once a disturbance started to happen, it would dampen itself out within 400 milliseconds. Now, they actually developed a component inside the engine called the rough combustion cutoff. 
that when, if the combustion became unstable for longer than that, the engine would automatically shut down so they wouldn't keep destroying engines during their testing. However, the problem is that doesn't work for a real launch because if you're launching the rocket and the engine cuts off, you don't have enough thrust to get into orbit. So they really have to solve this problem of combustion instability. Now, uh, the, folk, the key to this was the injector plate. That Remember that piece that the person was washing off with the hose on top of, on top of the uh, deck of the ship? That's why when I saw this picture, I was so excited about this, this injector plate, seeing it for real and seeing it recovered from the bottom of the ocean because this was the key, the heart of the system. Now, if you look at that injector plate, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of holes. There's about 3,700 holes on it in different patterns, in different places. And then there's these big copper baffles that are around it. Those holes are how all the liquid fuel, both the RP-1 and the liquid oxygen, are, are vaporized and injected into the engine bell. And it turns out the, the placement of the holes, the pattern of the holes, and the placement and pattern of the baffles has everything to do with the shape of the flame that burns at the bottom of a rocket engine and has everything to do with controlling or not controlling the combustion instability problem. So the engineers initially installed a series of copper baffles. I've highlighted some of them here so you can see them. And uh, these help to control part of the problem. Uh, they basically uh, had problems developing these too because the initial ones they put in were too small. They warped under the, the pressure of and the massive uh, uh, flame of, of the, the engine would burn with. And so uh, a few quotes here from Jerry Thompson. We tried every trick we could think of. It got so the engineers couldn't come up with a theory for the plate that they hadn't tried before. So they had to keep iterating and iterating and iterating at this problem. And one of the big challenges they had is that the combustion instability was both intermittent and unpredictable. Does that sound familiar to anybody who's dealt with networks before? Intermittent, unpredictable problems? I think as network engineers, we can kind of empathize with that. Uh, there was no consistency. The combustion instability would happen for reasons that the engineers never really quite understood. So they had to keep iterating and iterating on solving this problem without necessarily having a great definition of what the problem was. Now, uh, they had to eventually got to a point where the engine would no, no longer become dynamically unstable. But that wasn't good enough for these engineers. They decided that they had to introduce instability into the engine. In other words, they wanted to be able to produce instability on command. So what they would do is they got to develop a test where they would actually initiate instability by putting a black powder charge, basically a bomb, inside the engine bell and set that off while the engine is firing. In other words, when you have the engine firing on the test stand like this, they would set off a bomb inside the engine that would cause a massive momentary overpressure and the engine had to survive that too. Obviously that could never happen for real in flight, but they needed to introduce instability, the worst possible instability, and then the engine had to dampen this out as well. So really it became about testing and iterating and testing and iterating, small refinements, small steps forward to move towards their goal. And in mid-1964, they actually came to a conclusion of changing the angles of the holes within the injector plate. Uh, this actually reduced the efficiency of the engine a little bit, but it markedly improved combustion stability. So more and more adjustments were made till eventually they could set off a bomb inside the engine bell while the engine was firing, and the engine would dampen out that instability, not in 400 milliseconds, but in 100 milliseconds. So this was a major, major achievement in terms of making this engine uh, stable enough to launch people on. And this really for Rocketdyne was the turning point. So if we take a look at this, this, this graph here shows the cumulative burn time on the F1 engine. That you can see how it starts off with not very much burn time in 1962 and 1963, and they're getting more and more time burning and, and testing the engine. That two year period, two year plus period we talked about before, was broken into about seven months of testing with low thrust and about 11 months of testing with rated thrust, with full rated thrust, so about 18 months of testing, during which they would test and refine for that spontaneous combustion problem, spontaneous instability problem. And then about nine months more of testing with forced instability, that's setting off the bomb inside the engine bell. So by the time they got to the end of this, they had a very smooth running engine that would work smoothly under almost any conditions. And you can see from there, they got more and more and more testing, more and more burn time, into the engines to a point where uh, they were ready to actually do the first flight 
the first full flight. Remember, we talked about all up testing because this is not this is just the first stage, but they were also testing the second stage, the third stage, uh, all up testing first flight of the Apollo uh, Saturn V moon rocket. The first crew was put on the rocket here in late 1968 with Apollo 8, and it orbited the moon. Apollo 11 launched in July 1969, landed on the moon on July 20th, and then all of the follow-on missions and even beyond Apollo, including in the Skylab. If we take a look at the uh, what was achieved here, if you, Rocketdyne will say that the um, com one of the stiffest challenges the company ever faced was their combustion stability investigations, and solving those was one of their most satisfying achievements. All rocket engines have this concept to some level of combustion instability, but the huge size of these engines dramatically increased the size of the challenge in terms of solving it. And that injector plate was really key to solving it. That's why I, I make the assertion that this was the key component that got a man to the moon. Now here's the result. The Saturn V is one of the most successful launch vehicles that was ever launched, never suffered, suffered a catastrophic failure of the F1s. And, and look at that rocket in flight. Remember I said the rocket itself is 363 feet tall, but the flame coming out of the back of those engines is a third of a mile long. It's just incredible, the, the, the power and, and the capability of these engines, and it was really an engineering triumph uh, to, to create these. So uh, that's why I got so excited when I saw this picture of a person sitting on the deck of a ship washing off that component, washing off the injector plate, because to me, this is the central component that put a person on the moon. And just an incredible uh, feat of engineering. And remember, this really came down to only a few people to solve this out of you know, 400,000 working on, on Project Apollo. So how is this related to what you, as a network engineer, do every day? I mean, I, I, I really like rocketry. I hope you can see, sense of my passion about rockets and high performance aircraft and this kind of thing. I'm very, very passionate, very interested in those things. Uh, but how is this related to we, what we all do every day as, as network engineers? Well, we're not building a rocket with three million pieces in it. We're not building a rocket with three million parts, but we do build networks that have thousands of devices, tens of thousands of users, hundreds of applications, quality of service, embedded security, all the different functionality, multi-pathing, multi uh, failover, redundancy, all the different complexity that goes into building a network. And I would argue that effectively what we're building with networks is a huge distributed machine. Just like building you know, the, the complexity of a rocket, we're building the complexity of uh, the massive networks that, that we all work on. So in my, in my opinion, it's very comparable. And also, just like the moon landings depended on this rocket, your company absolutely depends on the network. Think about what happens in an organization if you take the network away. If you were to say, okay, I've got a major, let's say, hospital, and the network simply goes down, goes away, that's probably pretty catastrophic to the functioning, the proper functioning of that organization. So companies that you deal with, depend, no matter what industry you're in, manufacturing, healthcare, retail, everybody depends on the networks that we all build, that you build. And as a network engineer, you get to design the solutions. You get to solve the big problems. In other words, you get to be the hero, just like my hero, Paul Kastenholz. So I think it's, it's critically important to understand the level of uh, importance and the level of, of criticality to what we all do in building these large, complex, distributed networks. It, you should be proud that you get to be the person that actually gets to step into the breach and solve these big, important problems when they arise and design the solutions and the next generation solutions. It's an incredible privilege and you're carrying on an incredible heritage of the engineers that have gone before you that maybe worked in a different discipline like rocketry, but really there are many, many things that are comparable uh, between the, you know, what a rocket engineer would work on and what a network engineer would work on. So, uh, like I say, this is one of the reasons why Paul Kastenholz is one of my heroes, because he was central to leading this team that solved the problem with the F1 engines on a Saturn V. So if we take a look briefly at what does the future hold? Uh, we're, in my opinion, we're living in another golden age right now of space exploration. Just like the 1960s was a golden age with Apollo, we're really living in a golden age in many ways. Most people probably know there's a, a mission underway inside NASA called Artemis, Art Artemis III. 
The Artemis 3 mission is designed to put uh, people back on the moon by 2024. Uh, this is uh, the current goal. And that will actually launch on a new rocket that, that NASA is building called Space Launch System. This will actually also dock in orbit around the moon with a new space station that will be built that won't orbit the Earth, it won't be in lunar orbit, it will orbit the moon. This space station will be called Lunar Gateway and it's actually what the astronauts will dock with, work there before they go down to the moon surface and after they come back up. So we'll actually have a space station, not just in orbit around the Earth, International Space Station, but in orbit around the moon as well with Lunar Gateway. Now, here's a few more details on the space launch system that NASA is putting together. Uh, this is actually going to be built in several stages. The first stage will be Block 1, uh, which can send 26 metric tons into orbit. This will be a twin five-segment rocket, uh, solid rocket boosters on the side, very similar to ones with the space shuttle, but more powerful. And they'll actually be reusing the main space shuttle main engines that my hero Paul Kastenholz was program manager on the RS-25s. They will be re, uh, reusing those on the core stage as well. And by the way, the core stage of this just rolled out of the Michoud assembly plant uh, last month. So they are making good progress now on putting uh, SLS together. This will be enhanced in future with a Block 1B expl up exploration upper stage, which will actually be, uh, have the power to get humans to the moon and to get humans potentially farther out into deep space as well. It can launch a bigger payload. And then beyond that, we'll go to Block 2 of SLS, which will actually have a total, amazingly, of 11.9 million pounds of total thrust. If you compare that to Saturn V, biggest rocket that's ever launched before that was 7.5 million pounds. Now we're going to be on almost, almost 12 million pounds of thrust. And this would give us the ability to list up to 45 tons of payload out into deep space. So this will be a pretty amazing rocket when it launches and it's currently slated to launch for the first time with Block 1 next year. Now beyond that, of course, there's also a lot of other things happening with, in rocketry. We have SpaceX, who's been developing amazing rockets, starting with the Falcon 1 in 2008, which was SpaceX's first, run, first rocket they launched into orbit. And as, that was designed to carry the Dragon capsule. The Dragon capsule carried by Falcon 1 and now by Falcon 9 is what is actually designed as an uncrewed uh, component that is designed to re do things like resupplying the International Space Station, for example. Now, to actually launch the Dragon uh, rocket, this is one of the reasons they had to move from Falcon 1, the initial experimental rocket, up to Falcon 9 to carry their heavy payload of this. Now, one of the things that was just tested recently, about a week ago, was a Crew Dragon. So Crew Dragon is uh, the module that will actually allow humans to be launched on top of a Falcon 9 rocket and carry humans back in orbit from U.S. soil uh, back to the, US, to, the, to the International Space Station, carry U.S. astronauts there. Now, uh, this went, just went through a test where NASA actually blew up a Falcon 9 rocket, they launched it, exploded the rocket deliberately partway through flight, and you tested the crew escape system, those rockets on the side uh, that are called Super Draco rockets that launched this uh, capsule off the top, and basically that would be used for the astronauts to escape if there was a real emergency during the launch. So that was really the last big test that they have to go through with the Crew Dragon before launching it for real uh, up into space. Now, beyond this, uh, of course, the next stage is going to the rocket which was uh, tested, first tested last year, which is Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy is very interesting. It's actually a, a three-core rocket, uh, two outer cores and an inner core. And of course, the real innovation that SpaceX has brought uh, into the market is the concept of reusability. I don't know if you got a chance to watch the first Falcon 9 launch, uh, pardon me, the first Falcon Heavy launch when it launched, but it was an absolutely amazing launch they use clustering technology with the rockets on the bottom, so it has a total of 27 rocket engines that uh, Falcon Heavy land, launches on, not nine in each one of the three cores. And it was just amazing to watch that not only this rocket launch, but to have the two cores come back and land in synchronization. It was almost, it was beautiful. It was almost like ballet, watching the, 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 the two uh, rocket cores land uh, after, after propelling the main core out into space. It was incredible. Uh, to watch. So this concept of reusability is really the key component that SpaceX has brought. Now, in addition, of course, they're working on other rockets beyond this, like Starship, for example. So Starship will be an even heavier lift rocket, and this is really part of Elon Musk's plan to take human beings well beyond Earth orbit and out, in fact, to Mars, uh, and to create a, a, ultimately a self-sustaining colony on Mars. 
is incredible work that here that's being done by SpaceX and other private space contractors. I wish I had time to talk about everybody that's doing things uh, in space these days because there's many, many companies working in this area, but SpaceX is doing some pretty amazing things. So we've seen these heavy lift rockets like Saturn V. There's other ones. A lot of people don't know that the Soviet Union was actually developing a competitor to Saturn V to get a man to the moon called the N1 moon rocket of a comparable size and scale. The Energia rocket, also developed by Russia, and Falcon Heavy, which we talked about, and also boosters that come from elsewhere, like, for example, the Chinese have boosters, uh, like the Long Yenisei rocket, the Long March 9, which is currently under development, hasn't launched yet. And as I mentioned, things like SLS uh, Block 2 and Starship. Uh, these are all different heavy lift rockets that are being under, under development right now. Now, and I think these, are, in many ways, are very comparable to the heavy lift networks that we all build. SD Access, SD WAN, data centers, all of these massive networks that we build, in my opinion, are very comparable in many ways in terms of the complexity and the mission criticality to the rockets that, that we uh, are, are examining here and designing and building. So let me wrap up and conclude with what I, where I started with. I think it's very important in your life to have heroes, people that you look up to that embody some of the things that you want to be. And maybe you, that's, that's one of those heroes is who you already are. I pretty much can state that a lot of people are already heroes in somebody else's life. So you may already be a hero. That might be the people in your family, it might be people that are your coworkers, but you know, it's very, very important for you to be a hero to them, but it's also important to have heroes because heroes are, are who you can aspire to be. So when I think about somebody like one of my heroes, Paul Kastenholz, I think about the qualities that he embodied. I think about the capabilities that, that, and the things that he accomplished, and it's absolutely phenomenal. It's very inspirational for me to have people like that to look up to, and I think that you can uh, think about this in your own life and think about many, many different places where uh, you have heroes, or, or you can think about people that are heroes to you uh, in different ways. So I'm going to conclude and wrap up with this. Uh, this is something that's written on a wall in Vancouver. It's a wall mural on a building out in Main and 7th in Vancouver. I've always loved this saying, you never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I think that's just a great saying, but I'm actually just going to change it a little bit, and I'm going to replace that with a small group of thoughtful, committed engineers can really change the world. And, and think about the people that worked on Project Apollo. These engineers changed the world. They changed our perception of what possible is. They changed it from, it's impossible to put a person on the moon, to of course we can put a person on the moon. And we have that technology and that capability and that power. So this is just you know, something you should be very proud of as an engineer, is that you, can, you uh, have the ability to contribute in a way that materially impacts and changes the world. Now, I'll finally wrap up by saying, if you do want us to understand where I was kind of joking at the beginning of the presentation about understanding network innovations from the bottom up, you can attend the session that I'm doing uh, with my compatriot, Peter Jones, tomorrow here at Cisco Live called Cisco Silicon, the importance of hardware in a software defined world. And that's where we, I promise we won't go into quantum tunneling challenges at the seven nanometer process node, but we will talk about how we develop Cisco Silicon and how that actually impacts all the products and solutions that we build. So, uh, and like I say, I'm co-presenting that with my compatriot and friend, Peter Jones. And with that, I will wrap up and wish you well on your own personal journey, both here at Cisco Live and in your life as an engineer. this all over the world. It is like this in Finland. Turku Energia supplies electricity for hundreds of thousands of people. Because its operations network was independent from IT, an attack could have found its way into the grid 
and no one would have known, until it was too late. By extending the IT network out to operations, Cisco was able to help secure the entire system, both now and in the future. And with Cisco IoT technology, the new virtually fail-proof system is as reliable as it is secure, one unified network. It's why tonight in Turku, life will go on like it always has and always will. Between on and always on, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. For years, we've been hearing about IoT. Ooh, look, my cat just woke up. Let me put the lights on for her. It's time to get real. This is about big industry changing things, complex things. It's about a network of things that includes this, and these, and that thing, and whatever this is. You've got more data than you can shake a stick at, and that stick generates data too. This is industrial strength IoT. It connects turbines to power grids, pipeline operations to refineries, first responders to life-saving devices. It's a big challenge, and it makes a difference to our lives. So how do you meet it head on? Not like this, like this. Only Cisco can securely connect tens of thousands of assets at the farthest edge of your network to the heart of your business, no matter the scale. With security built in, not bolted on, and a flexible network to grow as your business expands. Now, IT is happy, ops are happy, innovation is accelerated, business is transformed, lives are improved. Between big ideas and big results, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. This is the data center, and it deals with demand. Demand that's coming from anywhere, any place, any device. Billions of things, millions of apps, clouds of all kinds. Demands for capacity, for analytics, for real-time insights, giving customers exactly what they want. And it's all landing right here. But that's okay, because you're not just waiting for it. You've got ACI Anywhere, a remote control that gives you the power to answer any need, choose any cloud, manage and secure any demand right from here. So tell them to bring it on. You're ready, anytime, anywhere. Cisco ACI goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The power is here. And here. But also here. And definitely here. Anywhere you need the full force and power of your infrastructure, hyper-converged. It's like having thousands of data centers, wherever you need them, powering applications anywhere they live, but managed from the cloud. So you can automate everything from here. Cisco HyperFlex goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. National Instruments had a predicament. Bandwidth demands were on the increase. And while growth is good, their IT budget wasn't keeping pace. Not so good. IT needed to deliver more bandwidth to offices around the world while keeping spending under control. That's not so easy. Suddenly, the company that helps engineers accelerate innovation found themselves needing help. Oh, and it needs to be fast, flexible, affordable, and secure too. A tall order, but by no means an impossible one. Not with the decision to turn to us, the people who invented the network in the first place. Using a Cisco SD-WAN solution in Cisco services, we massively increased their bandwidth. Where their budget held them back, we propelled them forward. Now most companies would be delighted right there, but we went further. Network deployments are faster than ever. And where their old network generated problem tickets faster than anyone could count, the number of WAN-related tickets has decreased 70% in the past year. All of this to prove that between those frozen processes of yours and free-flowing productivity, there's a bridge. Tell us what you're imagining, and we will build the bridge to get you there. Stel je voor, de eerste zijde uit China. Kruiden uit Indië. 
Day, the river, the suiker. Al de rijkdom van de wereld kan hier in deze plaats. For over 500 years, the lifeblood of commerce has flowed in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Today, it's on a scale and at a speed never before imagined, until now. There is a lot at stake. We have vessels entering the dangerous cargo. We have very large container carriers. If one gets stuck in the entrance, the entire harbor is jammed. Consequences, safety-wise and economically, are immense if something goes wrong. The logistics are easy, but uh, to make the puzzle work, that is complicated. Making the puzzle work is a network of sensors spread across the port's 41 square miles, providing terabits of data. 200 calculations a minute. Wind, tides, currents, and visibility to help guide 130,000 ships a year and protect 468 million tons of cargo. In my function, in my job, the security is the main thing. If we have the right data and the reliability is proven, we can predict what the situation will be three, four, five hours in advance, and we can plan with that. After careful evaluation and planning, Everything is, is possible in Rotterdam, and that's uh, the thing we are, we are proud of. The confidence to run Europe's largest port, and one company delivers all that sensor data safely, delivers all that data securely. Between the storied past and a modern efficiency the Dutch would call... Oh, lovely. There's a bridge. Cisco the bridge to possible. Here's a question. In a world where data goes everywhere, where does that put your data center? At the moment, trends are born, greeting customers with every detail they need. At the point where all your clouds meet and share, but also on watch, securing everything and everyone. In an uncentered world, you need a data center that extends to every branch, every device, every cloud, everywhere. The Cisco data center goes everywhere your data is. Between data everywhere and exactly where you need it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There is something unique about our baby's cry. Like no other sound, it stirs our instinct to nurture and protect. Unfortunately, those cries sometimes go unheard. Because in some neonatal wards in Uganda, there isn't enough equipment or staff. Now those cries can be heard with the help of a wearable monitor that displays critical information for each baby, enabling nurses to immediately respond with the proper care. This life-saving technology was developed by Neopenda, a medical device company serving emerging markets and underserved people. Cisco's support helped Neopenda further develop the technology that connects its devices. This is one more example of how Cisco empowers social entrepreneurs to use innovative technology to make the world better. Between a baby's cry and a nurse's care, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The Ellen Show is the number one daytime talk show in America. By far, the biggest thing we do all year is our Mother's Day event. It's so much fun and our fans just love it. We spend a lot of time aligning the show with brands that want to be a part of the Ellen experience. Hey guys! Hey New York! Hi! Hi there were a bunch of moms-to-be all over the country who tried to get tickets but they could not get tickets. We're usually working on a really tight schedule. The faster we can launch or join meetings, the better. 
Hi. I am going to use Cisco video technology to surprise them. I don't want to surprise the baby out of you, but surprise! Some of us are in LA, some of us are in New York. There's an enormous amount of collaboration that goes on between us. And it really doesn't matter if we're on a laptop in our office or on the lot. We're back and so far no one in the audience has gone into labor, but we're just getting started. Because we don't always have things nailed down until the last minute, communication becomes a really big deal. Being able to share, tweak, and review Microsoft Office documents within WebEx teams and actually see those changes as they're being made, that's huge. We do hundreds of integrations every year. So we've gotten to the point where if we weren't using WebEx Teams, it would just slow the whole process down. With Cisco WebEx Teams, we know this is going to be the best Mother's Day show ever. Between teamwork and the biggest show of the year. Be kind to one another. Happy Mother's Day! Bye. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every day, every night, everywhere. People are living on the streets. We see it. We all know it's a problem. But what can we do? In Brisbane, Australia, two young mates decided to do something. They would start small. They decided not to call them homeless. They would call them friends. Then, they outfitted a van with a washer, dryer and a shower and hit the streets of Brisbane to wash their friends' clothes. Orange Sky was born. One van quickly became two, then four, then 20. The operation, staff, logistics needed to scale and quickly. So Orange Sky found a partner. Cisco tailored a Meraki network that can grow as they grow. Intuitive dashboards at the head office and robust Wi-Fi in every vehicle let Orange Sky monitor vans and onboard devices remotely via the cloud. Cisco WebEx connects leaders in real time with staff and volunteers, whose energy and enthusiasm is essential to the model's success. What happened? Something wonderful. While friends waited for their clothes to wash and dry, they talked. A simple connection, joining a community, perhaps for the first time in years. If one load of laundry can do that, who knows what's possible? Between cleaning clothes and creating a community, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When mankind took its first steps on the moon, the images were captured with a lens made by Zeiss. When precision is in question, in manufacturing, science, medicine, anything, the answer, accurate to 200 billionths of a meter, is provided by Zeiss. Getting it right. Getting it precisely right. For nearly two centuries, Zeiss has set the standard for industrial precision and optic excellence. Looking forward. Looking further. And innovating to get there. Now, technology is pushing us faster than ever toward a more connected world. Can Zeiss lead the way? They're already there. Zeiss has partnered with Cisco. Innovation and precision are now online. A team from Cisco Customer Experience working with Zeiss has designed an innovative IoT strategy, setting a new standard for Zeiss connected data. Cisco Kinetic enables Zeiss to securely gather more information than ever, putting it to use in ways never before imagined, predicting performance and protecting uptime. Cisco WebEx brings Zeiss technicians and industrial customers together at a moment's notice, enabling innovation on the fly. The result? More advanced products, happier consumers, increased revenues. What they say is true. They don't make them like they used to. At companies using Zeiss, partnered with Cisco, they make them better between precision and the pace of business, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
I was running the plumbing business. It was great. We prospered and things were well. And then I got hurt and the spiral began. Every night across America, a half million people go to sleep homeless. When you're in the street, you are invisible. You're, you're out there, nobody sees you. You have to make hard choices, really hard choices. As unimaginable as that is, even more are at risk of becoming homeless. There are homeless from every profession, plumbers, electricians, doctors, financiers, a quantum physicist. Which is why we're committed to help put a roof over the heads of those who need one most. And for those at risk, helping them keep theirs. With all the homeless people out there, we were chosen for an apartment. It's better than the lottery. This is a place to live. Together, let's be the bridge to a place called home. I don't know you, but I love you for what you've done and how you helped me. Technology. There's never been more potential at your fingertips. But technology is only half the picture. Introducing Cisco Customer Experience. We're here to help you get the most out of your technology. Because behind the billions of connections, we believe there needs to be a relationship. Someone who can position you for continuous innovation. Someone who can help you design a roadmap for your next five weeks or your next five years. Someone who can be with you from whiteboard to reality. We'll help you transform not just your technology, but your business. We understand that your customers expect a lot of you, and we're here to help you deliver. Innovating, creating, delivering, transforming with the right people and the right technology together. This is Cisco Customer Experience. Between technology and where it can take you, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Technology often comes down to a choice. This or that. Do you need 5G or Wi-Fi 6? Mobility or security? Should you be in the cloud or a data center? Do you need this gen or next? The answer to all these questions is yes. Now you don't have to choose because there's one network that's ready for anything. It's called intent-based networking and it's only from Cisco. A system built for Wi-Fi 6? Yes. And ready for 5G? Yes. And the numerous machine languages of the IoT? Yes. What about security and threat detection? VR, AR, AI? The answer to your question is yes. Intent-based networking from Cisco. Wireless first, cloud-driven, data optimized. Between what's now and what's next, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
Good afternoon from beautiful Barcelona. We are talking today about Cisco Data Center Anywhere. And after this session, I hope you get to understand in just 45 minutes all the exciting innovations we have for you uh, to offer in the data center space. With that being said, let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. The very first thing you need to keep in mind is we live in an IT hungry world. Everything we do is driven by applications. We touch around three to 10 applications every single day of our lives. And basically, everything needs to be fast. We want things as fast as possible. We're less patient, patient, than, patient than ever. The other part is we want things to be easy. Whether we consume them or manage them, it needs to be easier as ever. And the last part, it always needs to be on. In a world where we have music or videos just a click away, we want things to be not only fast, but also reliable. So the same thing, by the way, happens today in an IT-hungry world, which may be you know, delivered by the CIO or, you, or yourself as an IT lead. If we consider everything we do to deliver these applications, we have to go from infrastructure, again, no matter where it lives, it can be on-prem, cloud, virtual, physical, containers, all the way to applications, which may be not only delivered with a single click, but also continuously monitored, continuously managed, and again, hopefully optimized as well. And the last part, we always want this business to be on. The new digital business needs to be reliable and always, need, and always needs to be secure. With that in mind, we are the only company that through performance IT, we can deliver all this on any cloud, on any app, anywhere, and we call it performance IT. We do not need to be bound to specific hypervisor to run agility, to run security, or to have better operations. Our idea is to run your business anywhere it takes you. With that being said, I wanted to make a quick poll for everyone out there. So whether you're visiting virtually, in this case, from home, on America, or Asia, or even Europe, please take a few moments to understand or to let us know how you are prioritizing your IT initiatives for this 2020. We have multiple options. So please go to pollapp.com slash latamse and vote for one of these options, please. The first one is, are you thinking about migrating to the cloud? Another one would be, are you thinking about delivering IT services faster? The third one would be, do you want to reduce downtime? Is that something that is constantly hitting you? The fourth one is probably, why not leveraging something like AI ops or AI, machine learning, and so on? And the other one that hits us commonly is security. Do we have any initiative in terms of security? Are we planning on doing some things like encryption or zero trust? So I'll give you a few seconds to vote so that you can help us understanding what your top initiatives are. In the meantime, keep in mind that, again, everything we're doing in the Cisco Data Center Anywhere story is going to be totally boundless. You don't have to run on-prem. You don't have to run cloud. You don't have to run on a specific hypervisor, as I said. Everything is going to be anywhere your business takes you. So with that being said, I know some of you may still taking your time to vote a little bit, but I'm thinking the other part would be probably to deliver IT services faster. We'll keep the poll open and probably get back to the results at the very end, but let's keep going with the presentation. The good news is no matter which option you chose, there's something for you in today's presentation. So let's get going. With this, I am going to invite uh, Jeff Allen, the Director of Data Center Networking in the Worldwide Sales Organization, to join me to talk about, about a very important topic. We're going to be doing three different categories in today's presentation. And the first one that I think every customer out there you talk to on a daily basis, Jeff, is agility. So how do you see agility driving or transforming today's IT? Yeah, so thanks, Carlos. Um, agility and innovation go hand in hand. And uh, if you're unable to be flexible and you cannot adapt quickly to change, then bad things happen. And the list of companies that have done this is very long and famous. A um, couple of names that come to mind would be Radio Shack or uh, Borders Books is another one. Um, uh, probably one of the most famous ones is Blockbuster, that you know, they, they were unable to change. Um, these companies are not unwilling to change, it's just sometimes there's something in their infrastructure that is unable to adapt to the changes that are happening so quickly around them. Correct. So, um, 
Cisco has been pretty good at this game. We've been you know, very skilled at making sure that we are introducing disruptive technologies, um, changing industries, and we've done this over and over again across compute, we've done it in storage, we've done it in voice. We have a good track record of doing this, but it's not by accident. And our internal infrastructure is set up to be able to adapt very quickly to these changes. Um, John Chambers was very famous for always saying that um, he would predict you know, companies that would be disrupted or industries that would be disrupted and sort of giving a glimpse of the future. And he would agree with us today if he were here when we say that 40% of the Fortune 500 won't be there in 10 years. And when I say won't be there, I mean they won't, not they won't be on the list, they won't be around in 10 years from now, which is incredible to think about. And all that has to do with the, the, a lot of these companies are not agile enough. Right. And that is the key metric that CIOs need to be looking at today is, is my company set up to be flexible and can I adapt quickly when I, when maybe I want to because I see the industry changing or maybe I feel like I need to because a competitor is stepping in my space. Correct, no, so it's either innovate or die, I guess, right? <laughs> it's, yes, exactly. So, Jeff, let me ask you this question. How are we innov innovating at Cisco? How are we helping our customers be more agile? Okay, great question, Carlos. So, um, we're doing two things that we feel like if customers would focus on these, they would not fall susceptible to, to the, some of the companies that we've mentioned. That is that applications have to be able to be deployed very quickly um, at anywhere, uh, on any cloud or in the data center, whatever the case may be. A lot of the applications are cloud ready, um, but the, the ability to deploy them, they need to have an infrastructure that's set up for the applications to get out quickly. So, right. um, and, you know, sort of the new DevOps model that you're seeing in, in lots of places today. The second is um, infrastructure. So, you know, the, the, uh, the compute, network, storage, they all need to have a good automation story around them because automation is really a big driver and it's a big key to, to this whole agility story. Correct. Well, let me then show a little bit of what we're doing today. I'd love to see it. And probably we're going to start with the applications. You mentioned the first one of two, right, about focusing on agility, and the, the first thing that we wanted to do is drive or deliver applications, whether they are the classical applications, your SAP, your ERP, all these applications that are used to maintaining the business up and running, and the other ones which are cloud native applications, which yes. are made for transforming the business down the road. And then, well, we would like whatever, whatever path you are in, right, the current applications or the cloud native ones, we want all of those to be a click away. And again, it doesn't matter where you want to place them, if it's on the cloud, if it's on-prem, if it's physical or virtual and so on. So for that, I wanted to introduce Cloud Center. So that's the very first solution we'll take a look at. And the idea with this is to have applications and services a click away. So let me go to the demo and really quick, click, really quick, as you can see, Cloud Center Suite is a SaaS offering where we are basically aggregating all clouds. It doesn't matter if it's physical, virtual, it doesn't matter if it's on-prem or public or even container-based. Just provide your credentials, and with that we will download every piece of offering that cloud has. So for example, things like instance size, the cost that they have, the operating systems they have. Once you have all that on a per-cloud basis, we can create a catalog, and we model that once. So imagine having a web server model once and then even having the ability to automatically scale that by saying, let's say I want 10 different instances in peak season, for example, right? Automatically scaling is a huge interest of, of lots of people. Now, once we model that service once, we can let our users single click and deploy the application. With that, let's put a name to it. And as you see, based on the credentials we provided before, we now can compare between all the clouds we have available. So maybe I want Azure and I compare it to Amazon. Well, as you can see, there's different pricing, different sizes. Same thing with Google, right? Different pricing, different sizes. So in my case, I'm just going to go, let's say for now, with Amazon. Let's click on it on the smallest size, and then let's click on Deploy. So again, with a single click, I have successfully deployed my, in this case, online retail store. And the web server that is holding this web page can also be accessed via SSH. I do not need to store any keys and everything is taken care of centrally, including the cost management. So this is a huge tool, I think, for centralizing in a totally agnostic way, whether that's Cisco hardware or any cloud, your, the way you deliver your applications. So with that being said, uh, I don't know, Jeff, what you think about this, but you also mentioned infrastructure. Yes, I did. So. Um, let's just take networking, for instance, as part of the infrastructure. There's a lot that goes to it, like we talked about. You know, there's compute and storage in this as well, but but network is one. And uh, when I started, you know, doing networking many years ago, 
I thought it was complex then. You know, things like spanning tree and virtual trunking protocol and all of the routing protocols and all these things seemed very complex at the time. But as we fast forward, we realize what's, what the IT administrators have to deal with today are, you know, they have virtual networking, they have cloud networking, there's containers, there's underlays, there's overlays, there's SDN. Um, in fact, uh, you know, virtual networking is a big part of this, and cloud networking is, is uh, the CSR 1000, by the way, I, I read that that's the most uh, popular download off yeah. of Amazon's oh, yeah. marketplace, right? So this is truly important to people. This is a big deal. So this is, um, if, if these things can't be, if we can't put all these in a wrapper that makes them easy to manage, um, then that's a losing battle for that network administrator or that IT department, especially because you know, different groups are sometimes responsible for these different components, right? And you know, some of the things we mentioned, like cloud, that's a different, handled by a different group. So we need something that brings all that together. Correct. So if I hear well, and multiple personas managing multiple things, probably not consistently, right? So how have you seen the evolution of the network? So we used to do this switch by switch, port by port um, troubleshooting. And you know, we would SSH into switch one, uh, we would make a change, and then we'd SSH into switch two. But while I'm configuring switch two, I took a phone call and I forgot to put in one command. So now I'm, I have some inconsistency in the network and I don't know that it's there. There's nothing that goes back and checks that for me. Right. Um, that's the type of thing that cannot happen when we're automating configurations, everything has to be consistent. Correct, so, well, that's, that's extremely relevant. So let me show you a little bit of what you're talking about with ACI. Excellent. So in this case, we're seeing ACI multi-site orchestrator. You have a central point of management for all your networking sites based on ACI, whether they are on-prem or cloud-based. Just by having these, you have automated data center interconnect, by the way. So even extending layer two is just a matter of minutes or seconds by having ACI, which is extremely useful in this case, considering it's a VXLAN configuration. The second part, now we move on the site level. Now, every time you add a new switch, usually it takes a long time, right? You rack, you configure the out-of-band management network, you have to configure lots of things. Here with ACI, we automatically discover every single switch you have. So the nice part with this is you have to put a name, a number, or an ID to it, and, do, and then you're done. As you can see in the demo that we're showing right now, not only VXLAN gets configured, the IP address, obviously the name and the automatic discovery of new switches is done exactly the same way. So it's only three clicks every time you add a new switch. The other part is very complicated things like BGP and VXLAN with MPVGP. Well, you just put an atomic system and number and you're done, right? Other things like DNS or NTP, things like, as you said, you were configuring on a per switch basis, probably configuring it one switch and the next one you would not configure it consistently. Well, you just have to do it once. Same thing with best practices. We have simplified quite a lot the model so that the wizard does everything for you. The other part is not only you're centralizing all the management and the monitoring for all your physical switches as we can see right now. As you can see in the diagram, we see the apex, the control points, the spines and leaves, but also every port is now centrally managed. You can see if it's red, if it's green, if it's yellow. Everything is centrally managed as I said. The other part is we didn't stop at the physical network. We wanted you to, to see things like virtual networks. You mentioned Microsoft like Hyper-V or Beamware or Red Hat or OpenStack. Well, we need to see that virtual network connectivity and how healthy that is being performing. And the last but not least part is containers. We said we might be moving to cloud native. So again, all the way to the containers, if you have Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, we will make sure that you see all the way to that specific portion of the network. So again, we're trying to cover the whole thing again from a single pane of glass in terms of network. So this is pretty awesome. If I had, uh, if I had both of these products, you know, one to control my applications, another one that can control my infrastructure, if I'm a company like Netflix, I'm not going to be disrupted. Um, I, you know, clearly these things would help me stay ahead in the game. So. At least the network won't be the one to blame for a slowdown. <laughs> exactly, yes. Exactly. So Jeff, I want to ask you another thing. There's another piece of equation, which is compute and storage. Yeah. So how have you seen that evolve? So um, we announced UCS 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago, um, a, a product that you know, revolutionized the way the server management was done. Um, customers loved it, it was, uh, it was received very well and it sold very well, still sells very well today. We introduced a lot of new products along the way and some of those were backup servers, um, 
we did rack servers after we did blade servers, and uh, and then we did storage servers with with um, Hyperflex after that. And so there was uh, there was a definite um, need to bring all of this into a common management platform. And UCS was good at that. But what we needed was something if I had multiple sites that made this very easy to manage. And um, we did an acquisition uh, after UCS of Meraki, and um, and that led us to some ideas, some things that we could do much better than the way UCS was doing them currently, you know, kind of a site-by-site -site basis, so. Right, right. And then, I think this also evolved, right? I guess we took some other models. What have you seen that we can do to help our customers then? Yeah, so um, it, by introducing Cisco Intersight, this gives us now a cloud-based management platform that all of my servers can log, in, log into. I believe we have 460,000 um, you know, current users on the platform today, which is just unbelievable. So, um, and uh, it, it is very much a Meraki, in fact we have this term where we call it Meraki-fied, that we have sort of Meraki-fied what UCS does. Correct. And uh, you know, kind of a, a cool term for it. Well that's great, and the best thing, just to start using it, is for free, right? It's free. Yes, So, awesome. Well, why don't I show you a little bit of how this actually looks like? I'd love to see it, yep. So, let's log into Intersight, let's take a look at it, and the very first thing is that we have the central dashboard where we can even see things like power consumption, right? All inventory of every server you have. So, we can start probably with things like rack servers. We can see things, for example, like graphical representation of every component of every server we have. So for example, in this case, we can see if the disks are fine, if there's an alarm, if there's something I should be concerned about. Again, everything from a central point of view, right? So this is extremely important. The other part is that you get also visibility for blade servers as well, and hyper-converged ones. So we get predictive analysis how, how soon you're going to run out of a storage, and not only that, but you're also going to be able to install everything, in this case, with Hyperflex, whether that's Edge or data center versions, directly from the cloud. So again, extremely huge in ter terms of automation. The other part is the devices, right? Not only can you do servers, the traditional ones, now we also support other things, like Apex from ACI, or integration with UCS Director, which may be a tool for automation that some customers are doing. So we're gradually introducing UCS Director integration as we move on. Last part that I wanted to cover before I move on to the solutions is the operating system. We will even install the operating system directly from the cloud for you. And the other part that we are now announcing is we can even create with single clicks solutions like Kubernetes installation and SD1. So as you can see, Intersight is a very powerful tool so that we can manage everything directly so from the cloud. Not just servers, not just converged, not just hyper-converged, but all the way down to you know, doing the operating system installation on the servers itself. It's pretty, pretty impressive. That's right. So I think, Jeff, I really wanted to thank you because I think we're taking agility to a next level. I and agree. Yep. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you want to you wanna mention before. I think that's, you covered it pretty well here, Carlos. So well, thank you for your time. Jeff, thank you for, for being with me today. So let me see if I learned well what Jeff just talked, us, just talked about. And uh, the very first thing is we're driving agility in two fronts. The first one, application delivery. So we are building Cloud Center so that you have a central point of modeling and even delivering the services that you want on any single cloud, plus your own tools. This is very important. Everything we do at Cisco not only has built-in automation, but it also has a do-it-yourself. So if you want to use Terraform, or you want to use Ansible, or you want to use other things like Poppin and Chef, we can always include that as part of your offering. So again, the result of that, we eliminate thousands of lines of code. We decrease end user wait time, and the best part, we can drive new services to transform our business faster than ever. The second part, network automation. We covered how ACI not only controls and manages cloud, but also multiple sites with data center interconnect. We have the easiest data center interconnect solution in the market. And the last part, we can move freely VMs from one side to another one, decreasing network provisioning times by 80%. The last part we saw is that with Intersight, plus again your own tools, if you wish, you can do compute and storage faster than ever. Even we can install solutions like Kubernetes or SD1 with a single click. So again, stay tuned because Intersight is doing a major uplift and we're going to announce more in tomorrow's keynote. With that, let me now introduce my good friend Danny McGinnis. Danny. Hello, Carlos. How great you to doing? see you. Hi, Dan. everybody. Thanks Danny, for having Director me. for Mar Marketing. So, Danny, we talked about in the previous section how we're building things faster than ever through automation, how we're driving agility in any cloud. But once we're running, things will break. 
Absolutely. And and then that's that's a part that I usually find very am uh, amaz uh, amusing. I would say <laughs> how we fix the stuff. So what's your take on that? So that you talk to a lot of customers every day in this, in this front. Yeah. So I think um, I mean you're spot on. Absolutely. Um, you know, we always come down to this kind of this blame game in networking, right? Especially, I mean, I lived on the customer side for many, many years, and a big part of my day was, um, you know, that troubleshooting and trying to find out, especially doing root cause analysis, like looking backwards and saying, hey, why did something happen, right? Or what caused this problem? And, and really trying to find out why it went wrong to avoid it happening again, right? So that root cause analysis piece is kind of, is very difficult. Right. So let's just talk a little bit about, I mean, you asked me to kind of double down on this. I mean, I think that, that whole concept of you know, finding where the problem is right now is really coming down to the fact that there's so many different teams and so many different components to what's happening on the network. Right. When I was you know, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of these things were done in silos, right? You kind of, you, you built the servers, you built the switches, you plugged the server in, it didn't move. Now things are dynamic, they're all over. They're moving out to a cloud, they're coming back. Applications are just, the way, the pace at which they turn up has changed so dramatically. And so with that, um, you know, really trying to pinpoint and find that needle in the haystack is not, a, not an easy thing to do. It's always a network, right? It's always the <laughs> network, it's always a network. So anyway, I think um, you know, a big part of where we're going at Cisco is obviously the innovation in the hardware and the infrastructure is a big component, but the the, le the solutions on top and the applications that have been, that we've been developing um, to really take, there's really two aspects to it. Analyzing the data and being able to store it somewhere centrally. Right. And that isn't just the network data, it's the telemetry data that's happening in the application, in the compute, in the cloud, in the network. Putting that into a common set of repositories so that multiple components can then go um, learn from it, correlate it, and give back very intelligent remediation advice or, or proactively fix it. Correct. Well, so with that, probably I can show yeah, you yeah, something, right? Yeah, 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 I think right? we're going to take us through a couple of these, right? Sure, all in right. the first section, we talked about networking with ACI, single pane of management for all things networking. We talked about intersite, single pane of management for compute and storage. Now let's talk about app dynamics. So we want a different lens in this case, which is the application view. So app dynamics, it's a SaaS or on-prem offering that shows the whole business logic on an application perspective. For example, in this case, maybe we want to see how our users are experiencing our applications. We want to see probably if they are accessing in one country or, the, the, or another one, or if they're having issues on one of them. For example, because the network is too slow. Or maybe they have a specific browser version or a specific device that, that they are not running the right application on. So we want to know as developers or as, as application owners if something goes wrong in any of these flavors. So we have full visibility all the way from the end user. I don't know if, if, it has cra if an application has crashed on you, but this thing happens as well. So it would be great to have visibility even at what crashed in particular after what the user did. So we have the full visibility even into crash information. The other part is the server information. We want a central pane of management so that we know how my servers are used in terms of CPU, memory, networking, volumes, processes. We have everything we need just from App Dynamics. And even if we are using containers, we have visibility at the container level. So again, it doesn't matter where you live, if it's cloud or not, we will get the visibility you need. Last part, the database. So in the database, we will see all the queries that were done, as well as how much CPU every query is taking. So we start with the user, went to the server, now are in the database, and we can translate this into business value. If somebody is not checking out at the very last page because of, a, of an error, we can see it right away. Or even better, if we're migrating to the cloud and we want to compare how we're performing pre-cloud and post-cloud migration, we have this tool to see it. So there's a lot of value in having analytics built on top of App Dynamics. As you can see, we, have, we can see the whole business logic and the whole business value. And if something goes wrong, we can fix it. In this case, we have a better together story as well. We talked about, say, ACI. We transport the network, well, well we transport applications on top of a network. So we have an integration with ACI here, where you can see the latency, the errors, every connection you have, and even troubleshoot directly from App Dynamics by cross-launching into ACI. Again, the nice part about this is that based on the application visibility or the application layers that we built originally, we now know if the web front end is the one that is experiencing some slowliness, we know exactly where each endpoint is located, 
and what the error is about. If it is the network, or in this case, it is the memory. Right, so again, unified management for both networking and applications. So, I don't know how, did you, did you like that part, the app dynamics part? I, I do, and I'll tell you, whenever we're, I talk to customers about this, the feedback we get is just that extra level of visibility. You know, that having that data and being able to do that level of correlation is, I mean, it's such a time-saving thing, I, and I don't even know how, how you can operate a network without some of that, frankly, totally. anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think the other thing you wanted to talk a little bit about was kind of this move where we've been talking a lot about going from reactive to proactive. Correct. Um, so kind of along the same lines, it, it's it, a lot of what is changing or I would say some of the coolest innovation coming out of you know, data center space at the moment is really this ability to collect data and analyze the data and then also use it to make you know, useful remediation insights. So we have this new tooling called Assurance and Insights. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a package with network insurance and ne our network assurance engine and network insights. Um, and really the biggest piece here is just that we're able to do things ahead of time. So being able to help you uh, make better decisions around everything from software upgrades to what resources are being used or how much resources are being used in your data center. Anyway, I know you're going to take us through it, so why don't you jump into it? I guess the best troubleshooting is no troubleshooting, Ab right? Absolutely. So absolutely. let's yeah, let's take a look at how that works. So basically, going back to my ACI central dashboard, in this case, I have an anomaly detection, an advisory message that says, go to your site on Miami in this case, which has an upgrade advisory. So we're getting an advisor because there's a potential vulnerability that may hit my environment. So in this case, we can tell you as a customer, well, basically there are these two devices potentially affected, again, nothing has happened yet, but they may affect your environment based on your configuration. We don't want that to happen. But before we upgrade, we want to know the impact of that upgrade. So we can verify if I will be impacted if I start upgrading. In this case, I can see the impact of change before it happens. Next, we can perform the upgrade with full confidence that there will be no impact, right? So we automate the upgrade directly from ACI by doing one, one node first, one of the two affected nodes, then the second one, again, fully upgraded, no disruption at all. And the last part is how do I make sure that everything, that it, everything is working after the upgrade the way it was before? That's where Network Insights covers that because now we can compare the before and the after. If something didn't go right, well, that's great because now I know immediately. I don't need to wait till for the user to be complaining about, hey, my app is not working right, and then go fix it. Yeah. All this is proactive, right? So proactive advisory, proactive, advi uh, proactive uh, network uh, management, if you will, and everything is done directly from ACI. So again, I think this is something that we have changed quite a lot in terms of you know, How there's a couple it. really big pieces that you mentioned there too, just around a change in general. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, we've been pretty good as an industry at automating changes, right? Scripting, off-the-shelf tools, homegrown tools. But the time that you spend modeling a change in a development environment, or all the post-validation that you do, work you do, Correct. is really eating up the majority of the time. So what I love about what these tools are doing, it's really helping out in that before and after, right? You know what the impact is, you can set your change control policies, that to align better with the business needs. Correct. And then afterwards, you're kind of guaranteed that things are going to come back up, you know. Tie that in with AppD, tie that in with some of the other multi-domain integrations we're doing. These are, these are really, uh, really, right. really time-saving. So, right, Danny. So the other thing, um, you know, that to, and I think that actually is probably ties directly in to cost, right? So, you know, I know we're going to go a little bit into, you're going to take us into uh, CWAM and what we're doing with Intersight next, but I think all of this is really about time saving and how do we cut down on that, that operational expense that we see and letting our valuable employees spend their precious time on the R&D side of the business and not waste it in troubleshooting things that um, just not a good use of their time, frankly. Yeah, and just think about all that CPU, all that storage, right? Just as we covered network before and now we go compute and storage, yep. all those wasted CPU and memory totally, resources totally. that are not even used, right? So what we came up with, by the way, it's called Intersight Workload Optimizer. Right, so the nice part about this is that embedded on top of Intersight, and as, as one of those modules, we're continuously optimizing and right-sizing the applications, again, based on AI and ML. So not only we have that for networking, we have that for CPU, memory, and even in a cloud agnostic way, as you will see in a minute. So should we take a look at it? Yeah, please. All right, so let's go back into Intersight. 
So login into Intersight, now we have a new dashboard for it. That's what we will be announcing tomorrow, so I don't want to spoil that. Hmm. But basically, the first thing is this is totally agnostic. We can just add the credentials of any resource you have. Any hypervisor, any storage, any network, any cloud. It doesn't matter, just provide your credentials. And from there, we will start analyzing how you are behaving or your infrastructure is behaving today. And providing you with specifics on how you can optimize not only your investment, but also your utilization. So in this case, for example, we can see there's congested, uh, a CPU that is congested. In this case, it, workload optimizer is telling us to move it. Or the other use case, among many others, is scale up or scale down resources, like memory or CPU. The nice part about this is that based on these recommendations, the only thing we need to do is now click on the actions we want intersite workload optimization to perform, and it will be done automatically. Next time, if I don't want to go and click so that it gets performed, I can create automation policies. So I can say, Intersight, next time you want me to move a load because of congestion, just do it automatically. I don't want you to tell me so that I go and click and then perform the, the action. The other part that is quite interesting, Danny, is we do predictive analysis on your resources. So again, doesn't matter if it's on-prem, doesn't matter if it's on cloud, we will tell you how much more you have till you exhaust your resources and even how much more investment you may need at some point. Another one that our customers have quite a lot is cloud migration. We can tell Intersight in this case, hey, just move all my VMs to Amazon. How would it look like? Well, basically today, some of our customers try to perform the same analysis, and most of them underutilize or overutilize resources. So if they purchase the same amount of resources at the cloud or on the cloud, that would cost in this case around $22,000. 93 out of that 109 machines are over-provisioned. We will make sure you always run with the right resources you need. Not only that, but we will also tell you where to place them, what the best possible location, how much it will cost, and then also the actions you need to perform in order to move and migrate those loads to the cloud. So again, this is extremely good because this is ongoing. This is not a one-time thing. Yeah. We will always continuously be optimizing things. You remember App Dynamics, right? So the other part is how my infrastructure is impacting my business, and well, a better together story with Cisco comes whenever workload optimizer plus app dynamics build up. And we can, for example, in this case, detect a yellow light saying, well, my business KPIs are not being met, and that is because of infrastructure. C1 detects it, or Intersight workload optimizer detects it, and we can execute the action so that in this case, we scale the memory up. After we do those recommendations, well, basically, we're having a self-driven data center, right? We can, up, we can refresh the window, and now all of a sudden, everything looks green. So again, everything is greater than before, fully automated, and now we have a proactive operations way of doing things instead of reactive. So Danny, what do you think about that? Any last minute thoughts that you, you yeah, have? Yeah, well proactive? I think, I mean, again, we're just, you, you, there's just so much data out there. And having the tools that can collect it and make these insights and, and correlation for you, not only are we saving people money, but we're saving resource money. I mean, that's really right. what a lot of this is coming down to. And more importantly, I think we're offering our customers the ability to give their customers just a better service. More yep. uptime, more agility, faster time to value so that they can start to see revenue, be better, be more competitive. So, I mean, these tools are amazing. I, I, I love watching all these innovations come to Excellent, come to tomorrow light. we will have a keynote and we will have all these great yeah, announcements. Yeah, it's going to so be exciting. Hopefully they can join. Tomorrow's well, a good day. Danny, thanks a lot. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. So let me see what I learned from Danny today. And the very, very first thing is we can monitor everything now. In today's world, it's not a matter of monitoring the network only or monitoring the compute part or the storage part. We have three lenses that are fully integrated with one another and we can reduce the troubleshooting points for application and infrastructure. The second part, we can optimize your investments. Through Intersight Workload Optimizer, we can see ROI within 90 days or less and we can increase utilization in 20%. We also saw cloud migration and other things that are extremely useful and the nice part again, this can live on any cloud, anywhere. It doesn't need to be Cisco gear. The third part, we can enable self-driven data centers. Not only with Network Insights, but also with Intersight Workload, workload Optimizer. Again, we can automatically right-size your infrastructure, get advisories, get again assessment and change, which may be network or cloud migration, and simulate some of those. So again, really, really useful to leverage AI and ML to the fullest. 
So with that being said, now let's move to the last section of this, this episode, or this, I wouldn't say episode, I want to say this segment. And uh, well, basically I have here my good friend Andrew Tennant, who is one of the regional managers in data center networking in the Worldwide Sales Organization and partner in crime several times. That's right. So uh, I wanted to bring you in for one of those topics that is always very important and is security, right? So how have you seen security play an important role in today's IT? Well, Carlos, look, it, it, as, as we can see by the folks walking around here at Cisco Live today, right? Security is on everyone's mind. It's absolutely part and parcel of what we do uh, inside and out in every one of our customer conversations. Now when it comes to um, the risk and the cost involved, the ROI is obvious, right? The average uh, data breach itself is over three and a half million dollars just for a single data breach, right? Um, and the, the massive uh, damages that have been incurred by companies just in the past several years have been out, you know, just outrageous. Yeah. Trillions of dollars lost, right? So the, the, the good news is there's a built-in reason to have these conversations because the, the downside is so substantial. Oh man, I know. I mean, these hackers are becoming more and more sophisticated every single time. So what are we doing to protect our customers, Andrew? Yeah, so f from our standpoint, the, it, when it comes to the data center, right, uh, y you can't secure what you don't see, right. right? So first and foremost, we have to understand what's actually going on. And to do that, we use titration as the foundation, right? Titration is like turning the lights on in the data center. We can see the flows, we can see the patterns, we can see the traffic. And once we have that and establish that framework, then we can begin to act upon that. Okay. And that's crucial because what it allows us to do is, in an intent-based networking approach, we can take what we've learned from that titration uh, approach and apply it to workloads both uh, in, in, our, in the infrastructure itself, uh, tied into anything going on at layer four through seven, and then ultimately we're going to tie that back into all of policy that goes end to end wherever that workload happens to be. Excellent, consistency is key, right? If we don't protect consistently, then I guess we are not protected at all. Consistency is important, that ubiquity is important, but also, again, that anywhere approach. We have right. to have a, a consistent policy regardless of what type of workload and where that workload may exist. Okay, and I guess the costing before, before the second uh, encryption is also not a good one, right? So yeah, yeah, so if, it, it's great if you have policy telling things, what can talk to what, that sort of thing, but. Uh, you still have to secure the actual payload and the traffic between these things, especially if they're traversing an arbitrary path through right. public clouds, private clouds, uh, hybrid spaces. So with that, encryption at all layers is crucially important, and we have solutions for that. So let me show you a little bit of a demo, how, how we do layer defense. Sounds yes, good? That, that'd be great. So let's move on to titration. As we can see, we have a security dashboard where we're analyzing multiple things, vulnerability scores, process hash, attack surface, and wait, Actually, that score did you see from A to B plus? So it seems that the, our forensics score just went down. So it seems that there is an endpoint, in particular the first one, that their vulnerability score is now at 50. So, well, we can double click there. By the way, it can be living on top of Amazon or any cloud. Again, this is totally agnostic to the hardware it is living on. And then we can get the full visibility of every command, everything that happened inside that workload. So that's really good because now we can see there, if you can see as well, that there's this process, in this case, Tomcat, that's a web service, right, that just executed this command called wget. Wget is a download command. So basically, my web service process is downloading <laughs> something from the internet. It shouldn't be doing that. So that's a remote code execution vulnerability. In this case, they are downloading this program called Minitools. So the nice part with titration is that now we can explore every single flow that has happened from a, in a historic uh, yeah. standpoint. So let's take a look a little bit deeper into it, and we can probably say, hey, I want to see titration, every flow yep. containing the recently downloaded uh, program, which is called Minitools. Again, we can see every flow from there, and then we can filter and say, well, I want to see who this is sending information to. Actually, this is an IP in China, by the way. And then we can also see which port it is using. Do you remember that you said that titration perform an initial application dependency mapping to understand who's talking to who? Absolutely, yep. Well, we can now compare that, that communication that we suspect is vulnerable to my initial ADM or application dependency mapping baseline. So let's do that. Let's put the source and destination address and the provider port. And as you can see there, it says that it should uh -huh. be denied. So this is happening where, when it shouldn't be happening. With titration, the only thing that is separating us from being secure is a single click. So we can say, I want you, titration, to enforce policies 
and my agent that was reporting all the flows now becomes a firewall. Yep. So this is true micro-segmentation no matter where it's running on. Now we can extend that policy, as you said, on the next layer, which may be the network. So probably you cannot install an agent on a mainframe or, or for whatever reason on a server. Well, you can define exactly the same network policy in terms of security now on ACI. Hey, you want a firewall that may not even be Cisco, it doesn't matter. Same policy, just drag and drop and integrate it into ACI. We're totally agnostic and integrate the policy in depth. So with that being said, as you can see, we can see a lot of things with a lot of things with titration. But also we detect threats. And this is extremely important because we're constantly running threat protection yep. and detection. So based on Talos, our intelligence group, we're constantly comparing the loads within each one of the workloads that are happening and the agents against our intelligence systems. And not only do we do that in titration, but we also do that on intersight. Yep. Again, so you're cons consistently and constantly protected, leveraging the full, uh, the full power of Cisco, in this case with Talos. So, I don't know how that looks like to That's you. That's fantastic, and right? It's, it's, the key is find it, remediate it as quickly as possible. That's correct. what it comes down to. Exactly. And leverage the power of the, the broad customer base to be a sensor for your own network. So correct. That you can find something somewhere else, bring that knowledge to bear. So, with that being said, I think we're extending that outside the data center, right? So we're, we're going to bring this to the campus and to the one, and making sure the policy is consistent, correct? So Absolutely. So again, the policy will go anywhere your applications or users go. And that, what, what's also important, I just want to come back to one thing we talked about. Let's never forget the, the simplicity of encrypting traffic everywhere it, it traverses, right? Because that's so essential, especially as, as the data lives everywhere today, so do the flows. So whether it's MacSec at the, at the server side, whether it's uh, IPsec out to clouds, whether it's CloudSec itself, right? We need to make sure that we're leveraging our differentiated benefits uh, for our customers' behalf. So it's a, it's a two-way play, if you will, right? Yes. First policy from the data center to the campus using ACI DNA center to the one using SD1 and vManage. And then, as you said, encryption, doesn't matter the cloud, whether that's MacSec or CloudSec at the hardware exactly. level or IPsec all the way to the cloud in the CSRs, right? So, well, it seems that we have pretty much a very comprehensive approach, but what if, you remember back at the beginning we talked about Cloud Center? Yes. So what if not only we deliver single click applications anywhere, but we deliver single clicks, single click protected and monitored applications anywhere? And that's where Cloud Center plays a role. So anything we deploy, well, we can, with a single click, install App Dynamics agents so imagine, a single click application delivered on any cloud, now it's also instantly provisioned, but also instantly monitored with the power of AppDynamics. And the same thing with security. So for example, again, if you want an application to be uh, titration visible, well, just install it with a single click from Cloud Center, and from there, you will have immediate reaction or immediate visibility into it, start doing application dependency mapping and threat protection. So, I think we, that gets us to the very end of our presentation. Uh, so Andrew, any last minute thing you want to say? I, I think it's, uh, again, it's not a, a feature or a capability, it's, a, it's an approach to how we do everything. Security is foundational to what we do, whether it's in the data center, the campus, the WAN, we have to have a consistent policy approach. Excellent, thank you, thank you Andrew. So let's finish up with uh, things that I learned today. The very first thing, you cannot protect what you cannot see. With titration, you see every flow, every process, everywhere. The other part is granular visibility automatically depend do application dependency okay, mapping right. and forensic analysis. I didn't want him to be worried because he didn't know I was going to. Second part is in-depth protection. So we provide not only our workload application and, and uh, protection, which some of our competitors do, by the way, based on a single hypervisor. We can do it for every hypervisor, any container, at the true workload level, which is the operating system then if it doesn't work for you to install an agent, we can go to the network, and then we can go to your layer four, layer seven firewall of choice. So again, the true, or the, the option here is to provide consistent zero trust no matter where it leaves. Last but not least, minimize the threats. So again, we have the full power of Cisco intelligence so that no matter whether you're running titration and or intersight, we will always detect any vulnerability and reduce that time to remediation. So with that, let me take you to my key takeaways for today. By the way, we kept running the poll for a while, and I have to say, Deliver IT Services Faster was the one that won. Then, migration to the cloud. So, I hope this was in line with what you, you all learned today. 
But my key takeaways for you are, one, agility. We need to provide services and we need to provide them fast. So by having built-in automation plus do-it-yourself automation will help you quite a lot in any journey you have. Two, see everything anywhere. We not only monitor everything through three centralized point of management, AppDynamics, ACI, and Intersight, but we are also automating and creating proactive operations. And third one, we're consistently secure at the policy and encryption level. So with that being said, all these demos are available on YouTube in Cisco Data Center Made Easy, so please take a look at it and follow us over there. So thanks a lot and happy Cisco life, Barcelona.